coming right there. All right, hey guys, Carl here with Tactical Rifleman, and this is not Chad. I, you guys know I've been publicizing this, and I was bringing in a not just a guest onto our live stream, but uh, somebody that I consider a personal hero. Oh. So, uh, John, uh, first, thank you so much for coming out. If you do not know who this fine gentleman is, uh, one, you've been living under a rock, but two, I'm going to let you know. I am because I'm long-winded, uh, but I'm going to for sure going to let you know. But before I do that, you guys know the deal. I got I to gotta, uh, share the love for our sponsors. Uh, we've, got our, we've got our mediators out there, our moderators. Chad is right here. You're not missing out on Chad. He's here. He's here. Hey, there you go. So uh, if, if you're a troll and you're in my chat room, I invite you to get the hell out right now. I don't have time for you. This is not the place for it. Uh, this is, uh, I've got good people here with me. I don't have time for your jackassery. Uh, but what I do have is a couple minutes to talk about our sponsors. We've got our usual loyal Tactical Tuesday sponsors. Uh, Sportsman's Guide right off the bat. Uh, see, I even framed their picture, dude. That's not bad. That's not not bad, bad at all. Right? Yeah. I use Tactical 20. That's our promo code. They'll take care of you there. EDC Coffee, you guys know I love my coffee. EDC Coffee is right up there, literally Black Rifle Coffee, all the other ones. We, and I got a promo code for them also. Uh, use code TACTICAL, saves you 10% off your whole order. <laughs> Big Daddy Unlimited is sponsoring tonight, along with Global Ordnance, White Label Armory. Um, you, you familiar with White Label Armory? No, sir. No, okay. So That's you, why I came to you. For the exactly, expertise. exactly. So all we all like our expensive guns, our fancy guns, yeah, right? Yeah. These guys with their <laughs> Daniel Defense and all these. You buy your expensive guns, but a lot of those parts are outsourced to other companies uh, to be made. White Label Armory was one of those places that was making all these parts, and they said, "Well, they're going on all these expensive guns, but we're the ones making them." They realized literally they make enough to make their own gun. So what they did was they offered top quality parts, but they're all in guns that they sell that you're paying white label price for. So anyways, white label armory, uh, great guns. <laughs> Safe Life Defense is sponsoring again tonight. They've got plenty of armor in stock. I have a promo code for them also. Tactical Rifleman, all one word, saves you 10% off everything at their, uh, at their website. Good stuff. Again, right off the bat, um, I would like to welcome everybody here to Tactical Tuesday. This is episode 76. But what makes this one special is I have with me today uh, John Stryker Myers. But uh, So you don't go just by Stryker, you go by... The nickname is Tilt. Tilt. Like the pinball machine. Is that like how you got it? That's where or it started. Literally. Yeah, years nice. ago, just rattling the old machine like when you... Lose at a pinball machine, you walk away pissed off. When yeah. I lose, I shake the shit out of it. I see my nickname, <laughs> Neon, and then I walk then away. Then you walk yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. You know, I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah. Um, guys, you know I'm old. I'm a fag. I'm a former action guy. That's me. I'm a former action guy. Green Beret. Um, served my time in the military, 25 years. Um, yeah, you guys know a lot about me, but... When people ask, Carl, why did you join the military? And I, what I tell them is when I was in junior high school, my son didn't know what he wanted to do in his life. My daughter don't know what they want to do in their life. They go through college, they don't know what they want to do. When I was in <laughs> junior high school, junior high school, uh, early 80s, uh, Saturday afternoon TV, I saw the movie The Green Berets with John Wayne. And I knew right then and there in junior high school, that's, that's what I want to do. Now, um, I want to go be a Green Beret. Now, fast forward, back in the late 80s, you couldn't just go Green Beret right off the street. You had to serve time in the regular army. I went infantry recon platoon because I wanted to be a good Green Beret. But the more I started getting into reconnaissance and... Uh, I was a recon originally in uh, in Korea, but then I went to the 101st. Uh, I got good at it, but my heroes, um, I my heroes were always going to be the Green Berets. But the you got you got to remember, I was in a peacetime army, 
And when was the last great war? It was for special ops guys, it was Vietnam. And my heroes quickly turned into not just John Wayne and his little A team of actors, it turned into the Mac V Sog guys. And I would see them at the VFWs and I'd talk to them and uh, uh, a lot of them don't share their stories. And unfortunately, a lot of them are gone now. Oh, yeah. Um, but you know, John, again, brother, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us. And um, for a lot of a lot of our viewers, they have no idea what Mac VSOG is. They don't even know what the acronym stands for. So oh, okay. you want to you want to give them a give them a one over the world of how <laughs> John they know how you got the nickname Tilt. <laughs> how'd you get in the Mac V Sog? Well, it it uh, all started out after flunking out of college, and uh, in fact, you and I have something in common because I saw the movie The Green Berets. We just got done our in country training. I said that's what I want to be. No, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, but then within a day after after we saw the movie at the end of our in-country training a little guy comes out and he, and he goes we're looking for volunteers and my buddy Johnny McIntyre goes for what Sergeant Major can't say either you're in or you're out oh that's the best stuff that's and, that's, and a lot of people shy away from that there's, that's there's not a you a few that's guys shy away well we just saw the right. damn movie yeah. I read the book yeah so um Johnny Mac and I and a few of our other buddies that we went through combo training with, we all signed up. Went to Da Nang. That's where the headquarters was at the time. We go in and uh, we all had our pads and pencils and sit down and, yeah. and the sergeant major comes out for the briefing and says, put that shit away. This is a top secret briefing. Welcome yeah, to the secret war. So, so he, yeah, yeah. he told us in front of you is a document. You cannot talk about anything we say from this point forward. Sign it or leave. And we all stayed. Signed the document. Then we got the introduction to the Secret War, which at that time, this is May 1968. The Secret War began for the U.S. technically in June of 64. Uh, okay. Ran for eight years until uh, 19, uh, let's see, 64, 72. Really? It Ran continuous. 64. Now, See, I didn't even know yeah. that. Yeah. So the first, in the first couple of years, there was a lot of juggling, trying to get air assets mm -hmm. dedicated to yeah. the mission because um, that was always one of the issues in the early days. And uh, when you went across the fence, we had no direct support from any traditional units, uh, no artillery. It was strictly air power. Yeah. Our air power. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, the secret war had been going at that point for four years. We signed up, go through the briefing, and uh, it was the Military Assistance Command, Vietnam Studies and Observations Group. Initially, they called it a Special Operations Group, but they realized the Snoopy ass reporters would glam in on that. Special Ops, yeah. So they called it Studies and Observations Group, and um, <clears throat> they kept it hidden from the public for years. And um, so that's where it was set up. And so we entered the war in May of 68. By that time, uh, which we didn't realize, was that um, there have been several uh, SOG recon teams that had either been completely wiped out mm -hmm. just in the first four and a half months yeah. of 68. We lost several teams, many of which are still missing in action today. Yeah. And then in our case, me, Johnny McIntyre, and John Hutchins, we flew up. We get on a South Vietnamese helicopter. Nobody <laughs> told us about this part. So we're in country, you see all the movies, the TV and everything. Most of the footage was always Yui's. We go, wait, what's this? It was a Sikorsky H-34, which had the old B-17 uh, nine-cylinder head engine in it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and, up in the nose of it, right? Yeah, underneath yep. the pilot. The pilot yeah. sat on top yeah. of it. So they had a better view. Yep. And um, it turns out it was just really something that we fell in love with because the South Vietnamese uh, pilots were fearless. I'm alive today thanks to them, to the recon guys on my team. So we get on the first ride, we go to Fubai, I get off, a recon team gets on. It disappeared and never heard from again. Welcome to the secret war. That's I, how I got my job. I want that to click 
I want that to sink in. Literally, he's there 12 seconds, and the team that got on the helicopter um, disappeared. If you guys know our book list, um, Tactical Rifleman has a book list at our Amazon store, and um, most of them are reference manuals, survival manuals, this manual, that manual. Uh, very few of them are actually history books, uh, but the top of that list is the book SOG. And I, I've mentioned the book before. If you guys have never read that book, besides we're going to get to your books here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there are lots of little vignettes in there where they, like you, like John was saying, a team would disappear forever and um, never to be heard from again. That That's just, that's crazy. Well, yeah. And a lot of people can't fathom that today where... Um, We've been fighting this freaking war for 19, 20 19, yeah. years now. And it, they just keep dragging this thing on and on and on. All right. Um, but anyways, so you've been there 30 seconds. 30 seconds. The team goes in. They disappear. A bright light, which is a team designed to go in to find yeah. a team. They go in. They get shot up completely. One guy's KIA. All the Americans are wounded. Um, some very seriously. And uh, one guy literally had his boot blown off by American hand grenade, mm. which was an indication that the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, the communists, yeah. had our weapons. Yeah. And we assumed they got it from our guys that we assumed, yeah. again, without accurate knowledge. And so today, you know, one of the heartburns for us, you know, 52 years later, yeah. Glenn Lane, well, 53 years, Glenn Lane and Robert Owen, the two Americans on that team, are still amongst the 50 Green Berets that are listed as missing in action in Laos alone, just from the secret war. Yeah. Plus, you throw in another 100 plus aviators mm -hmm. from the Air Force, the Army, yeah. and the Marine Corps, because the Marine Corps had uh, gunships assigned to uh, support SOG mm -hmm. across the fence. And they were amazing. They're, and the aviators were just, they yeah. put their lives on the line every day. You know, you've worked with aviators yeah. enough. Today, you have the 160th. I actually visited them, uh, a couple of them today while I was at Fort Campbell. I did. Uh, I got to see what Bell hopes uh, the 101st selects to replace the Blackhawk, but it basically looks like a Blackhawk, uh, but it's got tilt rotors like the, like the Osprey. You can't drive in the back like, a, uh, like an Osprey. You know, you can put yeah. ATVs and razors in them, but picture... Because a Blackhawk's already faster than a Huey, right. much faster oh, than yeah, a UH-1. Yeah. But now, once they once they tilt those rotors forward, that that puppy damn near runs as fast as a P-51 Mustang. It literally hauls us great gas mileage. So um, I yeah. hope you and I live long enough to see all the new toys they're getting on. on yeah, but the that, news. is that the variation of the Osprey? Yeah, yeah. We'll have to talk about that later. Yeah, I got some. I've ridden on that thing in Baghdad uh, and Iraq a few times. I didn't know, but you got to remember the Osprey was 1980s technology when they first started coming out with them. Right. This thing, they say they've taken all everything that they learned from the Osprey, and now they've put it into this new replacement for the Blackhawk. So we'll see. Yeah, but we'll they go see. into an LZ. They can't defend themselves. Yeah, it literally, it, it comes down so slow. We had to change our tactics in Iraq, literally. You, there's no more landing on the X, no more landing on the Y. You have to land far enough away that they can't hear this thing. And then you've got to walk in, which, of course, somebody lets them know. And now they've got time to set up ambushes. And Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the Osprey. That, that, that's, uh, that picture's actually taken the night I got on that Osprey right there. Yeah. Um, uh, there they are. Did, did I step out and you started talking about the stuff? I'm not sure if we can even mention what we looked at today. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. These are not very... the droids you're looking for. Not the, at the, all. The place that had all the no photography <laughs> signs, Carl. <laughs> I didn't take a single picture. I didn't today, either. Chad. Mental images. Those things were pretty cool, even though I didn't <laughs> see what I saw. Ish. We have a good time. Yeah. We definitely uh, had a good time. All right. Um, now. <laughs> All the teams, they have different names. Yours was uh, uh, Idaho. Idaho, right. And so so, tell us about the, what, what, what makes up a team. Like I always see there's always uh, 
some Americans, but then there's some indigenous troops yeah. also. Well, when I landed in 68, there were six FOBs. So FOB-1 was Fubai, where I landed. Forward operating base. Right. And so uh, FOB-2 was Contoon, okay. which was down two core. And Vietnam was divided into four cores. Mm -hmm. I core was right on the DMZ. Then you head south, there's two core. Three cores where Saigon was, the capital of South Vietnam. Four core, Mekong Delta. Okay. And um, so FOB-3 was at Quezon. FOB-4, Da Nang. FOB-5 was Bami Tuat. And then FOB-6 was Honok Tau, which was uh, northwest of Saigon. Okay. And so those two FOBs ran missions into Cambodia under different rules of engagement. And the rest we did either, like FOB-2 did both. They did Cambodia sometimes or on the Pir Parrot's Beak, which was right between South Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Okay. Horrific targets. Uh, and then our targets up north in Laos or the DMZ. And then sometimes for uh, going for down pilots into Laos or North Vietnam mm -hmm. on occasion. And so... What makes up a team? Uh, the teams were made up of two or three American special forces. So by 68, it was all Green Berets running the teams. Okay. And we had indigenous troops. So in my case, I had South Vietnamese. And the team that got wiped out, uh, we were fortunate because Spider Parks had been on Idaho had just gotten promoted to take his own team. So he didn't go on that fateful mission on May 20th okay. of 68. Yeah. So they kicked Spider back to, okay, your team's not going to be your old team. He was the 1-0, got Don Wolcom to be the assistant team leader, 1-1, one, one, and then I was the uh, radio operator, 1-2. Okay. And, of course, I had gotten busted before I went to Vietnam. So I was an E-deuce holding down an E-8 slot. An e a E-2 private. Yeah. Green Beret. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, now. So Spider promptly promoted PSC so I could roll up my sleeves so people would think I'd be a sergeant. <laughs> How do you get busted? Uh, do we even want to ask? Or just... Oh, no, this is it's just a bullshit thing. Uh, because I was commo, yep. our whole commo class was sent TDY to Fort Gordon for 12 weeks to learn uh, RTT, radio teletype. Yep. Cause they, because the SOG camps had to have Top secret green berets on the teletypes. Yeah. But they were just tightening things because there are obvious leaks that we were dealing with during the eight, eight years of the Secret War. Okay. And so we're down there and we just ran into two butter bars, two young lieutenants just out of OCS. And uh, they had all these rules. You're supposed to be in bed at 10 o'clock. You got to do this. You got to be up morning formation. And we just ignored them all. Yeah, of course. So finally, yeah. they, they, they had me and Johnny McIntyre, my buddy. They brought us in, <laughs> and the, I'm the first one in. They had eight Article 15s. This guy goes, pick one. So I picked one, crumbled it up, and threw it at him. He goes, you got nine. <laughs> and so I got demoted right there. Then Mac went in. He got busted. And so we were E-deuces going to Vietnam. Well, you know what they say, John. What do they say, Chad? Good combat soldiers don't make good garrison soldiers. <laughs> no, there's so much truth to that. So much. I got to introduce you to Sularu someday. You will love him. He oh, is that right? Does uh, a boy named Sue? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sue deserted from the French Foreign Legion. Really? To, to hit the boys a train wreck, full blown train wreck. <laughs> you would love Sue. Sue would definitely break glass in time of war. That's why me and Sue, yeah, got, yeah, yeah. we got along so well. So uh, good people. So the indigenous troops, like my case, I was had South Vietnamese that yep. were fearless. We had Chinese Nungs who were Chinese and they had been in South Vietnam for a few centuries. Mm -hmm. And they were taller and just unquestionable valor. And then you had the Montagnards. And sometimes we had the Cambodians, and there were very mixed results with the Cambodians, but the Montagnards were just amazing people. They and were they were a little smaller stature, though, weren't they? Smaller stature, yeah. couldn't throw a hand grenade for a shit. <laughs> Could probably kick a soccer ball, though. Oh, no, yeah. not even that. No, really? This is, this is primitive. Oh, we're yeah, going yeah, from yeah, loincloths. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they, they're good with crossbows, but uh, can't they can't throw they a got... hand grenade. No, no. So and, we take uh, it for granted because, you know, our, our American pastime before they invented video games was right. baseball. Sure. You know, any American boy could throw a baseball. <laughs> but uh, I've seen Europeans. There's a reason why the Germans had stick grenades because they, that's, likewise, they couldn't throw a grenade to save their lives either. <laughs> 
Go ahead, man. But no, so so uh, like in our case, it would be like we had three Americans in the beginning, and we had nine indigenous. So we had to go out and rehire for all the ones that were killed or mm -hmm. missing. They had listed missing in action for months before they formally declared them dead. And so um, we trained. We had to train up the new people, including me, because mm -hmm. I was green as grass. And then uh, so it'd be three. And then when it came time for a mission. It would be the three Americans and then three or, or five indigenous okay. that would go out on a mission. A helicopter full of guys. Right. Yep. And uh, sometimes, depending on the elevation, time of year, the heat, et cetera, um, might be two helicopters. Yeah. And I prefer the six-man team because under a firefight, you could usually get six on one bird. Okay. And that way it doesn't necessitate getting the second bird in and getting it out and mm -hmm. leaving two or three guys on the ground. Yeah. So there are a few times we ran eight and in the beginning, that's the way it was. And so all the other teams were designed that way. And then by uh, November, um, it was just me and Bubba Shore, John Shore, that came on the team. Um, Don Wolken, the spider got promoted to Cubby Rider. Okay. Don Wolken eventually became a Cubby Rider. What's After, a Cubby Rider? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you had a FAC. So Forward the code name was... A yep. Ford air controller, yep. and for SOG, you had an Air Force pilot that flew the plane. Yeah, but you had a Green Beret SOG veteran who'd been on the ground. He was the combo link to the people on the ground. Yeah. So in my case, I was very fortunate. You know, I had Spider Parks. Yeah. So when we're in tactical situation, Spider would put his left ball on the line to, to get us out of there. And the advantage of having somebody in the aircraft that understands what's going on on the ground, it sounds trivial, but uh, you got to remember, think triple canopy jungle, think uh, cloud, feet. yeah, I think cloud cover. Uh, he can't see what you're doing. They don't have, they didn't have the thermals that they have today, but even with the thermals we have today, uh, a lot of times they can't see you, but by you being able to, talk to him and he knows instead of them having to ask hey what are they doing right now he already knows uh that fact knows what's going on in your head knows what your team's trying to do and he can foresee what the needs are of the guys on the ground he can maneuver assets and uh, before you even ask for uh so i i actually got a chance to fly on a uh, ac-130 specter gunship in um over Afghanistan while there while we were doing some ops there, same type thing. Really? Uh, I got to fly on um, <laughs> a J Stars plane, uh, which are terrible for ground surveillance radar. But the reason why I flew on it was that was right when um, the um, I don't remember what op it was. We had a op go sideways in the initial invasion of Afghanistan right when the AWACS plane was off station refueling and right. the J stars plane, which had good radios ended up playing the part of it. So we started putting guys up on that. Uh, so I've been in that seat, but never, never had to do the, the combat ops uh, support, like what you're talking about. I can just imagine even being as bored as <laughs> he was up there. It's such a critical role, brother. Such a critical role. Oh yeah. Role. Once, once, uh, once we were in a tactical situation, then things really heated up. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, in John Plaster's book, you're talking about John's books. Yeah. Um, he talks about one of the times, I think very briefly, he's very modest. But there are times, a couple of times, and I've talked to guys who were on the ground who were new. It was their first or second mission mm -hmm. on the radio. Yeah. And John said, look, you got to walk him back. You, first of all, you got to settle down. Mm -hmm. Take your time yeah. and talk so I can hear you. If yeah. I can't hear you, we can't give you tactical air. Yeah. And there are guys that have written about being calmed down by John. In our case, Spider Parks. Yeah. We had another young radio operator and Spider or Pat Watkins. Mm -hmm. These guys were veterans that had been on the ground. They knew what was going on. And it's just a it really it's a critical link because a lot of times you don't you don't have to explain so many things. You can just say, We got this, they know what that means. Yeah. Like in terms of the enemies coming from here, if they've got to, we need to help to find an LZ because we can't see it. We're in a hundred yeah, there, there feet could tall literally be an, an opening well, yeah. 300 meters away and you'd blow right by it because you couldn't see it well, in the jungle. Yeah, or yeah. in one of the major firefights we had, 
uh, we were engaged for four hours, stacked up the bodies, and near the end, um, Spider just said, I think I found a spot where a helicopter can hover. And so the South Vietnamese helicopter pilot, Captain Tin, came in and literally hovered for 10 minutes. And we had to run through elephant grass, and it was only 15 yards yeah. at the most, but it took us 10 minutes to get through that thick elephant grass, yeah. which is like 10 to 15 feet mm -hmm. tall. We wound up falling down and run over each other to get to the helicopter. Wow. And so he hung in there for that period of time. So we didn't know there was anything. We thought we were Couldn't just in the jungle. It. Yeah. And Sparty goes, no, go here, pop, pop. And right. uh, you said a four hour firefight. Now, um, a lot, a lot of our viewers, they've seen the movies, the seal break contact drills where everybody shoots a full auto. They do the pretty Australian peels and everything. That's, good for breaking contact one time, and then you run as fast as you can. If you can run. If you can run, exactly. And that's <laughs> the part a lot of people don't understand is, uh, right now everybody, uh, a lot of people, a lot of my concerned citizens out there, they, they, they have plate carriers, and you see a lot of military guys with just three magazines. They might have another one on their belt. Um, but, and I try to tell people, look, that's, the war we're fighting right now is not where you're going to get in a sustained gunfight. You were in a four-hour sustained gunfight, the one you were just talking about. Yeah. And I, one of my favorite parts of your book is, because uh, I'm all about logistics. Logistics is very important. <laughs> uh, guys, this is his book, uh, Across the Fence, and... Uh, uh, the link for it, is, and I'm, hopefully Susan can put it in the chat window for you. The link for it at our Amazon store, but you can you can get it anywhere. Uh, again, across the fence, we'll, we'll get to your other book here in a minute. That's right. No, no. Um, but there's a place in here, and it's just kind of this is what everybody else carried. This is what we carried, and this is what we didn't carry. That's literally, I believe, is the name of the chapter. Correct. And uh, stuff we carried, stuff we didn't carry, chapter 16. Um, I'm looking at the list, and I'm looking at, and we've, we've done some crazy uh, modification of gear and stuff. When I saw that M79 that you guys had cut down. You were envious, weren't you? I was you like, wanted one. Why didn't we cut that down like that? We shortened it. That's but what we Jocko didn't. said. Dude, Jocko Willing said the same thing. That thing's the size <laughs> of my freaking pistol. M79. Um, four hour sustained gunfight. How many rounds, and you're running what, 20, 20 round mags, maybe a few 30 round. No, no. we Just for, 20 round mags. This is 68. No 30 round no mags. No 30 round mags. So everything was 20 with 18 rounds in each. Eight, yeah, because we download a couple because the, the oh, military the spring. mag springs compress. Right. And yeah. So um, and I still do that to this day. Everybody oh, yeah. says you don't need to with modern mags. Yeah, well, I take a chance. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we did that yeah. and it went, went through 600 rounds plus every hand grenade. And then I carried 10 to 12. How many mags do you have to carry to have 600 rounds of ammo on I you? forget the math. Oh, my 18, God. 18 divided is <laughs> 600. I, I think the number, I, I, <laughs> it's a lot. All right. Um, guys, John is a legend. He's a monster. He's a solid piece of steel. I got that. He, <laughs> he is. John is smaller than I am. All right. Um, put you in the hot jungle where humidity just eats you alive. And I, I read the stories, brother, and it's just, it's amazing. You're talking 90 pounds of gear. Right. And uh, you didn't have all the tough book computers and spotting scopes and satcom antennas. You were carrying how many frag grenades per guy? Uh, well, the Americans would usually carry 10 to 12. 10 and to then 12 frag grenades. Frags. Then you have one Willie Peter for good luck, always a Willie Pete. Yep. And then you have one CS, uh, which are tear awesome gas. in the awesome in the jungle, thick woods. If you got to break contact, right. CS is awesome. I'm agreeing with them there. Without <laughs> without no, Be, uh, I have CS so many bad guys in training. In training, I've never I've never fought in the jungle. I've never fought in thick woods. Uh, but and I've I've said this before that the the toughest missions I've ever done 
were missions that we did in training because SF, you, you were never an SF in, in uh, a peacetime army, but we would, uh, we would make our training missions so hard that uh, any con anything that could possibly go wrong would happen. And uh, yes, breaking contact, CS is awesome. I see us so many guys <laughs> in the 101st. I see us so many Marines, so many people in the 82nd Airborne. Is that right? I would see us every, that was first thing for breaking contact. Because uh, all we had were blanks, full, full auto, CS grenades, and then just uh, start breaking contact. Uh, Dude, I can't get over 600 rounds in 18-round magazine. Now, don't forget our M79. There's another 12 there for that. Oh, my God. And so then I carried the radio and then the battery for did it. Did you run a pistol, a sidearm? No. Uh, with the M79, we had uh, ball bearings for the first round. So nice. if, we, if we got caught up in between mag yep. changes, that was ready to go. Okay. And you just pull up and pop. All right, now, I, I've... I, and I, I'm, I'm big on um, improvised anything. Oh, yeah. Uh, Claymore Mines. I love hearing about some of the old Mac V. Sog stories about um, Claymore Jesus. Mines. Did you ever use Claymore Mines? For... Is the Pope Catholic? Do you yeah. like sex? Yeah. I use Claymore. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. All right. Okay. Um, you don't forget, you got to ask me about the five-second fuses. Yes. Right. Uh, elaborate. Five-second fuses. <laughs> we had... Um, because several of our teams had just been overrun, mm -hmm. uh, one of the thoughts was, what else can you do if we have to run? What can we do for delay tactics? Yeah, because now remember, gents uh, and lasses, we got a few females here. We got, oh, you see them the sitting in the Oh, yeah, there they are. Yeah, the yeah. Right, there they are. Yeah. Back females. We love them. We love them. Uh, the Claymore Mine, that's that flat-faced one, slightly curved, ball bearings on the front, C4 inside. It's designed to be command detonated. It's got basically 100 feet of wire with a clacker, designed to be command detonated. Mm, that's not how you guys use them. Right. And uh, we only did it a few times, but the one time we did it was on Thanksgiving Day, 68, when uh, the point and the tail of two different NVA divisions were coming after us. So we were slowing them down with our gunfire at MC9 fire and claymores. Yeah. Clackers. And then if we moved back to the LZ, we put down claymores with five second fuses, pop the fuse and run. And then we're, again, we're rotating yeah. the security, but still it's a more of a run to get yeah. away from the claymore. But so even if they're down. running forward, um, that five seconds, they're, they're pretty well getting right on top of this thing when it goes off. They ate them. <laughs> and, but it, it slowed us down enough. Yeah. Slowed them down enough so that we could get to the LZ. That buys you five more seconds. Yeah. And that becomes 10 seconds and that becomes 15. And you buy enough five seconds, that's enough time for you to get on the helicopter safely. And because you're into training, the training that we had done, hours of doing just that with claymores, with the, with the time fuses, so that by the time I get back to where the helicopter is going to come in at the LZ, as I can hear him approaching, uh, Bubba and uh, Sal, or one of our South Vietnamese, and myself, we all three had claymores that had been placed as we're doing uh, moving backwards. Yeah. And so the final blast, we blow these claymores off, jump on the helicopter, we're leaving, because there was like single canopy jungle in mm -hmm. Cambodia, you could see more. That's why we could see them literally running towards the port arms. And they came out of the jungle as we're lifting off, and it was muddy. And they're trying to stop and as there's, their feet are kicking up clumps of mud into the props. And they're oh, trying shit. to come down with their AKs, but me and the door gunner and one of my little people, I forget for Sal, we hit them so hard. You ever see those cartoons where guys are running and they stop and get jerked back? Yeah. That's what happened to the NVA. They're coming out of the jungle and we hit them and stopped them, pushed them right back into the jungle. We didn't even see the nice. follow-ups and oh, yeah. Now, the, the, the tactics that these guys were using, um, Claymore Mines with the, with the delaying on them, I'm several generations behind you. Uh, again, <laughs> this is one of my heroes. This is cool because I get to sit with one of my heroes here. So I show up to Fifth Group right after Desert Storm, and uh, there was a warrant officer in my company, Chief Sexton. He had gotten out of the military for a while, 
and uh, came back in uh, much later in his life, but he was actually a Vietnam vet. He was one of the only Vietnam vets in fifth group that wasn't uh, like in, at command level already. Right. He, he was a warrant officer, but he was a team leader on that A team. And uh, we started doing some training and same thing. He's talking about using the Claymore mines with the uh, fuses on them. And um, remember, fifth group's a desert group. Right. So we're normally, I would have said, well, that, we can't do that because five seconds, that doesn't buy us enough time. Um, but these Green Berets are smart. Uh, Chief Sexton's like, no, we do two minutes in the desert. I'm like, you do two <laughs> minutes? And it's because you're breaking contact at such a longer distance. Yeah. They would have uh, a 30 second and a two minute time fuse and the different uh, uh, Claymore mines got two universal cap wells on the top. So as you're breaking contact doing that, the same drills that you were doing, I grew up getting taught by no kidding. by literally <laughs> the exact same drills that you were you were being that you were doing. I learned them when I first got the group, but they were modified to stand off because you're engaging hundreds and hundreds of meters away by the oh, time yeah. they got to us. If they were a long ways away, you pop the two minute time fuse. If they were close, you pop the 30. But either way, we I was still taught to carry that claymore, plant that claymore, and then haul ass. After that guy goes by, last man, get on my gun, and then I'm turning and going. I, I was taught the exact <laughs> same stuff that you that you guys would that is so cool bro. and we're alive today thanks to uh claymores and, and other and things live today. and I, <laughs> i've never never had to fire claymore in combat brother i've i've done nothing um i've i've done nothing compared to well, what you guys did not not at all i've been around some i've been around some great guys that did some cool stuff uh a lot a lot of marines that did some awesome stuff around me uh, but no, dude, this, this is awesome. This is awesome. Hey, and, and I don't want to cut you off. Uh, no, Chad, no. I bet our peanut gallery has some questions for this fine gentleman right here. Yes. Let's we're, go for it. We're going to open it up. Let's get a, let's get a question from the peanut gallery. Here. All right. First one, uh, one of our peoples, uh, Miss Susan Bridger, her husband, he does she, he doesn't have very Glenn. many heroes. Glenn, <laughs> he likes John Stryker Meyer more than he likes Carl Erickson. So no, give, me too. If me you too. Give Glenn, him a shout I'm out, right Glenn. there with you. And he's an Australian. <laughs> Australian. They live in Australia. Down under, eh? Yes, yes. If you could give him a shout out, that would be awesome. Glenn, here's looking at you. Hip hip, Glenn, you Wally. <laughs> I don't do a very here's good. Here's to you, sir. I don't do a very good Australian. I really don't. Right. <laughs> I don't. That they uh, they say I sound more like I'm from uh, Britain. Britain. There's yeah. no T. There's no T in in uh, British. You know yep. why? Yes. We dumped all that shit in the harbor. <laughs> Your Australian is so bad, it sounds like British. Uh, all right. So first one here comes from our boy Hemingway. He said, "Was just dropping by to say I miss you guys. Bummed. I have to miss out on this on this one in particular, John." You and all your SOG brothers are true BAMPs. Are you familiar with what a BAMP is? Bad a ass badass mother mother okay. skin. Yep, just checking. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Glad to see you're still making the rounds so nobody ever forgets all the crazy epic shit you guys did. Take care and God bless. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. We'll, pass, we'll pass the word on to our brothers yeah. for sure. But you know, like in, in the world of SOG, if you had a Richter skill, one to ten, yeah. ten being the very hairiest SOG missions in history, yeah. I'd put myself at a five compared to Lynn Black, um, the men that earned the Medal of Honor, yeah. guys at Green Berets that died on the LZ, mm -hmm. let the team get out first and they died and they get the Medal of Honor. These stories are just amazing. Without a doubt, without Absolutely. a doubt. All right, All right. Our next one here is from Le LeBlanc. He's actually uh, parachuting with me and Chad uh, <laughs> down at, no, in Palatka, Florida. We're going to put on the old World War II garb and we're going to jump in Florida next month. We are With we're the T-10? Uh, actually, I think we've got other shoots, but... Uh, I would hope, for your I sake. I would hope. I don't want to jump a deep end. <laughs> Just finished Across the Fence. What a fantastic read. Thank you, Mr. Myers, for everything you and your teammates did. Rangers lead the way. 
Indeed. Uh, in, yeah, for sure. How about a question? I could read these all day long. Uh, and you got me any questions? I've got one here from, let me refresh this real quick. Uh, let's see. Oh. And, and thank everybody for the kind comments that are, that are rolling in. Uh, I appreciate it. And uh, um, I always talk to our people about it and let them know that there are many Americans out there that appreciate our stories now that they're getting out. Yeah. Thanks to you, Jocko, and books. The old fashioned way. Yeah, the, the old fashioned way. I think a lot of people prefer the old fashioned way with the books. I think it kind of gives you that. It's tangible, it's in your hands. I, I know I prefer the books. My I'll wife be, and I are the same way. The way. I love the sip because I do a lot of driving to do right. drive to go classes and stuff. And I love to be able to sit back and, uh, for example, this. We're. We're recording this, and I know a lot of people don't want to look at crusty old John and crusty old Carl. I got that, but there's a lot of people that like to sit back and listen to what you have to say and hear it in your own words. Uh, so I, I really do appreciate you doing these these podcasts. Well, I heard about you. That's why when you asked, I said yes. Really, you were preceded by your notoriety. No shit. Another SF legend. He's got to remain. I got to protect my sword. Who, who'd you Who'd you hear? Some uh, white guy. Some. Uh, all you crackers look alike yeah, to yeah. me, dude. You really <laughs> do. So you can't remember the name. Can't. Uh, that's right. Short term <laughs> memory is like fading, man. I, uh, anyways, I heard about you beforehand, so that's why well, we're here I, today. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Uh, so they got a question there, Chad. Uh, Jerry J had. We named our units SOG because it's guys like you, John. No, Jerry, Jerry J is uh, Czechoslovakian special forces, so they kind of is that right? Yeah, yeah. He's uh, oh my god. Well, hats off. He to actually you, sir. did Operation Valkyrie last year. Remember, I talked about the kayaking yeah, yeah. trip we're doing sure. this weekend. We're two days away from it. Uh, Thursday, the clients show up, and uh, hopefully, no one dies. Hopefully, hopefully, it's <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> gonna be a good time without a doubt. It'll be a good time. Uh, John, maybe next year I'll bring you out, dude. You can be the part of the uh, the Op Four commander that tortures. I'll, be the, I'll drive the canoes to the water, we, kayaks we, to the water. We, <laughs> we're gonna snatch one of them this year. They don't know about it yet, and that's the one that gets interrogated real bad. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So uh, a little seer action. Huh? I'll spoil it. I won't. But okay. we'll let you do the torch. I'm sorry. Tactical yeah. questioning. Next Indeed. Year. Tactical. You can be the guy that does the tactical question. Who brings the battery? What's that? Who brings the oh, battery? Batteries? Do you oh, want better? I got a, yeah, yeah. I got a 15K generator. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> All okay. right. And this is from Chris Lloyd. Hey, Carl. Great to see you. Got tilt on Tactical Rifleman. Take it easy, Chris. All right, brother. We don't have any questions. We don't. No, we got lots of people showing the love. They well, love yeah, that you're here. Chris is a fellow vet. He's I, working there, working though, hard. I have a question for you. Sure. Um, was there ever a moment where you were literally like down on your face? This, this is it right now. This is, <laughs> this is when it's going to happen. Uh, yeah, I, that was the, there, I had one of those moments and it was the one of all the missions where there's that moment that, that come to Jesus moment. Mm -hmm. So it takes a little while to get to it. But, um, we had a uh, Chad and I were talking earlier about going in in the morning we go to a target and get shot out of the primary, or secondary, and the alternate. Come yep. back, have lunch, go out. Well, we did this for two or three days in a row. Either on a second. Literally, yeah. go in. Get just shot get, out. And the only reason you get all shot all the hell is because the enemy are so thick in that area. Right. No matter what random spot you pick to land, because you randomly select a primary, uh, a alternate, a contingency. Uh, yes. There's that many bad guys out there. You yeah, and sometimes it would only be one person. Yeah. But you know the idea is you want to get yeah. inserted. Yeah, you want to get inserted without being compromised. Yeah. So we did this. I I want to say now with the 53 years of hindsight, um, the third day we did the morning, mm -hmm. and some of my Vietnamese are beat because you know what it's like. You fly in the helicopter. You're a general. You're, you're amped up. Yeah. You go in. You go in and get shot out. Come back. Eat lunch. Go do it again. And there. Uh, like in the afternoon, here's your target. Company's gonna pick an LZ for you. Uh, just do an area recon. That's what we're done with the mission. Mission prep. So we line them up, get on a helicopter, go do it, get shot out, shot out, shot out, come back, do it again. On the third day in the morning, it happened. So we transferred a couple of our little people because they're just beat. Yeah. Fortunately, I had Sal, my Vietnamese counterpart. Yeah. By now, I'm the team leader. Um, so we get inserted. 
This time we're on the ground. And we went in with eight men. And I had Henry King with me. He was strap hanging and Bubba okay. Shore. So you had three Americans. Three talking. Americans, five in, indigenous troops. Okay. And um, Henry was carrying the pump M79 experiment. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was the experimental round. one. But he wanted to carry it to see what it would be like. Yeah. Okay. So we get in and the jungle was open up more there because the, the Laotians would do slash and burn agriculture. They would okay. come in, plant crops, burn it and burn it until the ground was no of no use. It just they took all the soil nutrition out. Yeah. Well, we landed on an LZ where they had several of these. Okay. I put the team online. We just marched up the mountain, crossed the hedgerow, marched up. We never stopped because normally we would go 10 and 10. March for ten, move for 10 minutes quietly, wait 10 minutes to hear the jungle. But on this day, I just wanted something different. Yeah. As I pushed it, we went up the hill for over an hour straight. We came to a trail, big trail, big enough to drive tanks down. Nice. Wow. We crossed the trail, get on the other side, and we have high ground looking down on the trail. The ambush is set up with claymore mines, two claymores, a C4 in the middle, designed to knock out the person walking past. Okay. Everybody else is in the kill zone is dead. That perimeter of security I, claim worth. I want that to sink in. You guys are literally, you said it was just C4 in the middle with no shrapnel. Yeah. Because you wanted to stun and knock out the guy in the middle. So we could take him home. You were trying to snatch somebody. Oh, yeah. POW oh, snatch. POW snatch. And we'll okay. come back. With, the footnote is on, on, for some of your viewers who may not have heard how that technique got developed. That, that'll be the footnote. Okay. But we set it up, security claymores, and a claymore in the back. All right. And Sal did a wiretap. So we're watching this. People are just diddy bopping down the trail, yep. you know, all well, cool. Because we really moved up that mountain. And we heard nothing from the LZ. Okay. Because often you hear from trackers. Yeah. So it was a great mission. Um, Spider comes back. And I, I gave him the code. We got a POW. You know, rally the assets. I'll be back at the primary zone, primary LZ in an hour. He goes, don't move. And basically, other things. Don't move, don't shit, don't do anything. I'm at 10,000 feet. I can't see the mountain you're on. Let alone come get you. Yeah, okay. Two minutes later, we hear tanks start up above us. <laughs> and so, to make a long story short on this one, we had to pull up the ambush and the wiretap. We went back across the trail, and then we turned left and went straight to get away from as far as we could from that area. Um, and about that time, as we were moving, we could hear the dogs. They had the NVA had tracker dogs yeah. out, so they were down still in the primary LZ area, and I wanted to get as much distance between us. Okay. We moved until about dark. We came to a like a little stream bed or a brook. But it had water, maybe a foot, two foot, depends okay. on areas. And each bank was about 10 to 12 feet, maybe 15 feet tall, I forget. But I put the team in that, and we went up the stream, and it was dark. I had the guys move out, come back, move out, come back. And then we started sprinkling black pepper and powder mace for the dogs. screw up the dogs, yeah. yeah. So as we're going up, eventually that night we heard a couple of dogs hit the mace. Okay. So we and Sal had climbed a tree and said there's buku over a hundred lanterns he counted of people he could see the lanterns wow. in the background coming up the mountain looking for us. So we go up the stream, we were in the water for maybe a couple hours. We finally come to a bank, we go up the bank, set up an RON, I'm facing the bank, and two or three hours later. Two NVA are in the stream. They walk past us with their lantern. They go up. The lantern runs out of fuel. They come back. As they're going past, hep, my interpreter, coughs. And the one NVA started climbing up the bank. And he only moved when the wind blew. So eventually he got to the top of the hill. And I'm sitting there with my feet spread. I got my car 15 on a single shot. Yeah. And I hear this... Touched my boot. And I could hear him catch his breath. And he didn't move. And then when the wind blew, he moved back down. Took him a while. He got his buddy. They left. First light, we were out of there. So, leading to your moment. 
during that day, we moved up that mountain. And again, we didn't hear anything in terms of dogs. And we took a, a sow, uh, took us to another stream angle, and then we basically climbed almost straight up this mountain. And here's poor Henry King hauling all his M79 rounds. So he buried some because he just had too many. Mm -hmm. And by near the end of the day, we came up, we took a short break, and um, everybody wanted to stop. All the Vietnamese, Bubba, Henry, I'm tired. We're beat. Oh, I bet. Just carrying the weight. Yeah. So I, Sal goes, no, we got to get to the top because if we get into the shit, we want to be on top. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody that's on top is, yeah. you know, high ground. So I just started to get up and I fell, literally fell over. And I had a bad knee, which was my left knee, and I landed on my right knee and tweaked it. Tried to get up again, fell again, and literally fell on my face. And my face landed in the jungle floor. And I'm lying there, and this is that, here's your, your moment. I'm lying there, beat. Last night they, taught, they touched my boot. They came for us with dogs last night. I'm the one zero, the team leader. I got these, all these guys' fate in my hand. And I'm sitting there like face down. We got to go. We got to get up and go. And just that moment, that was the, uh, the come to Jesus moment for me. Is that just being there and figuring we, somehow you got to get past the pain, mm -hmm. get back to being a team leader. We got up, got to the mountain, got on top. And uh, five days later, we, we got extracted under heavy fire. Of course, that night. Five more days. You guys oh, no, were oh, sorry, four, four more days. We were on the ground that night. Still but, four more days. But Spider said, you know, he flew over every day. Yeah. The weather, we can't get you. Yeah. Do not move. And so we didn't. But this, that first night on the mountain, which was day two of the mission, Russians came in with aircraft and did resupply, aerial resupplies in Laos to their people and the Laotians in Laos. So they had plenty of chow, lantern fuel, yeah, uh, water, ammo, for probably fresh dogs. And it maybe <laughs> probably had fresh dogs. <laughs> no, uh, tracking dogs wear out. They do. They they wear out. Um, crazy. You had a bad guy grab your boot. That's he just no, awesome. he just touched it. He just crawled up. He touched the boot and then... Realized what it was. Re yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, a jungle boot feels like a jungle boot. In it the does. Dark. He knows exactly what that is. Oh, yeah. So uh, that, that that one moment in time, sir. Mm. Dude, that's just crazy. That's oh, why yeah. we... It's funny because we'll get guys that come up and thank you for his service, this, that, and the other. And it's hard to explain to them you guys back in them days those guys we looked up to because like even carl you know carl will tell you we we're never more than what an hour or so away from you know like yeah civilization so to speak you know we go out do our work yeah we come back we're sleeping on a cot sometimes it's at a tent but still you know we're back at our main yeah you guys had a areas. lot of ieds too man yeah but i mean no matter how bad things got i knew I just had to be able to hold on till the sun went down yeah. and they would put a specter gunship over my head. I'm Ooh, the bravest over, guy right? on the planet if I got a specter over oh, my yeah, head. Oh yeah, me too. We I'm, went through four one night. Yeah, but your specters <laughs> were um what the caribou's with seven six two miniguns and the pilot is steering it. That's uh and they have to be able to see the ground. The ones we have now, they're pressurized. They can fly that high that the plane stays oh, is that right? pressurized. It's got a 105 howitzer right. in the tail. It's got a 40 millimeter Boffers cannon, danger close 23 feet. I'm not allowed to say that on the open internet because no, it's classified. No. Yeah. Oops. Uh, and then they replaced <laughs> the 20 millimeter chain guns, I mean, uh, Gatlin guns, with 25 millimeters because going to higher altitude, it's got a lower dead rate, uh, dud rate. And they're insanely accurate. I, I flew on one and we. They zeroed the guns over the Gulf of Oman and they dropped this flare out into the water and they're zeroing the guns and they're blowing the, blowing the water up and this flare is just bouncing around like a rag doll. They hit the flare with a 105 howitzer shell. Now, remind you, that's not the accurate gun. The accurate right. gun's the 40 millimeter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I'm the bravest <laughs> son of a gun if I got spooky over my head. Well, the, the uh, specters that we use have four mini guns and two 20 mic mic cannons. Oh, man. And they brought it within 25 feet. 
That danger night. close. Oh, you're really danger oh, close. Oh, very danger close. Yeah. See, we wouldn't. They wouldn't even. There's no way they would let well, us. Well, you know do what that. the Air Force guy goes? He goes, says, I said I wanted it at 25 yeah. feet, you know. He goes, no, I can't do it. He says, you got to tell me that you accept the responsibility yeah, for any responsibility. casualty. Yeah. Hey, these, they're right here. You know, like, anyway, so I had to say, I accept full responsibility. Now get these motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that, I mean, that night, we were up there all night, and we could hear them dragging the bodies along. Mm. They come back, and then uh, around four o'clock or so, uh, the weather kicked in, and we were getting low on hand grenades. We started throwing rocks at them. <laughs> yeah, because they, they didn't know. They don't know. We're, they're playing, we're playing, yeah. is Johnny throwing a hand grenade or a rock game? Yeah. And, uh, and you know, we, we hear stuff like that, the old, the old stories. Yeah. And that's actually, I forgot what movie it was. That actually popped up in a movie. Um, it, but, you know, Hollywood takes a great story and ruins it by making it too Hollywood. Right. right. They, ruin, they ruin every good story. They ruin every good story. But every <laughs> once in a while, uh, there'll be some little vignette that makes it into the movie that no, nobody knows where it goes to, comes from. Right. And literally, that's you up there. You know, we only got two live frags left. Let's throw rocks. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and Sal and Chow, they, would, they went out. They would leave our little perimeter, and they went out and got the rock and brought them back. And they're going through the dead bodies and stuff to get these things. And uh, oh yeah, so there was a few hours there because we I I want I think it was either three or four specters now again yeah this is February 1970 when we did that and uh, we lost lost track but man they killed a lot of people oh I bet and I'm very brave with them yeah absolutely mm. and then that last couple of hours that's what we did and we finally did a white phosphorus just for good luck <laughs> <laughs> shake and bake oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, dude, this is so cool, guys. You don't understand. I've yeah. got one of my legends they here, love it. right here. This is awesome. <laughs> they're I, loving it um, out there. Any, any more questions or no? Let's see. We'll find some. Real quick, though. Um, see, quality of content. John, they don't ask questions, you know, because yes. oh, they're, okay. they're hanging on every word as it is. John's oh, okay. uh, book, uh, I've been through it twice already, uh, Across the Fence, John Stryker Myers, uh, The Secret War in Vietnam. The expanded edition is the one, that's what this one is, that we put the, the link in our Amazon store. Guys, you don't have to order it through my Amazon store. If you do, I get credit for it. I think I make like three-tenths of a penny. Um, all at once? Or but, yeah, all yeah. at once. But <laughs> the reason why I put the links for all the books that I like, uh, the, like the Foxfire series of survival books and stuff, is because I want you guys to get the correct book. All right, So that's why that's there. Um, your other book uh, that you wrote with John Peters is On the Ground, The Secret War in Vietnam. Um, w which book do you prefer? Well, the first book talks about us getting involved in the secret war. Okay. So that's my favorite. And there's a couple stories in here that I couldn't get when I was putting together the first book. Okay. We had a deadline. We want to get the book printed for our reunion. Yeah, yeah. Have it in time for the reunion, you know? Right, so the second book, because trust me, guys, you get done with this one, you're going to want more. You're going to come back and watch this video again. You're going to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I remember when he said that. Second book is On the Ground, The Secret War in Vietnam. Uh, they were wounded or killed in places where they never went. Um, like I said, this these are the stories that I grew up on. I actually, one of my first jobs in fifth group, uh, got the uh, got the fifth special forces group. That was the SF group that ran Vietnam for the most part. Um, got the fifth group. One of my first uh, taskings. It wasn't really a mission. Was they had recovered uh, some remains of a guy in uh, Cambodia, coffee. black coffee. rifle coffee stat. Stat. Got to fill the vein. Carl, would you like one? Um, Thank you, Chad. Not a problem. Yeah, I'll take one. I'll take one. I got I got my thermos of coffee, but I can you know, never turn down black rifle coffee. No. Never. Um, they recovered remains of uh, Mac Visog team from Cambodia. Not. Right. I don't think it was your team. 
and I, to the life of me, I wish I could remember the guy's name. It was on the tip of my tongue a couple of days ago. Um, he was from upstate New York, and we went and did the funeral detail for him. And um, at it was it in North Carolina? No, no, this was upstate New York. This was oh. you got to remember. I, I'm I'm old. Oh, thank you. Not as old as you. I'm not quite dirt old. I'm just old though. <laughs> this was I want to say 94, 95 time frame. Maybe a little later than that. Uh, no, when would that would have been 97, 98? Anyways, long story short, I went up there to do the funeral, talked to his. This reporter up there and his family. Oh, he was such a nice boy. He was such a nice boy. Great. At the actual funeral, 500 bikers show up. I'm not joking. 500 oh, yeah. bikers show up for the funeral. We go to the little uh, funeral afterwards, and um, the, he was listed as MIA, but his team had come back from Vietnam and told the family, look, he's listed as MIA, but we... We left him with on right. the radio, and they basically he kept the radio keyed so the B-52s could bomb on it like a like a beacon. Right. Um, so they knew he was dead. But uh, everybody was saying he was such a nice guy, such a nice guy. Well, that was my first time at that funeral actually meeting some of you. They were the Mac V saw guys from his team. Wow. And they uh, they were like oh, <clears throat> nice guy. Oh, hell no. This boy was an asshole. And <laughs> apparently he had l made it home and uh, got in trouble. He had beat a couple guys almost to death and went before the judge. He was wrong. And uh, the judge asked him, why did you? I guess both of them were literally like on the verge of possibly dying. He beat them that bad. And he just looked at the judge and said, in my world, they deserve to die. And uh, the judge gave him a choice. You can go back to Vietnam. Well, he went back to Vietnam, yeah. went back to Mac V. Sog. And uh, <laughs> long story short, he ended up dying. But um, here I am, Green Beret. I had my CIB from Desert Storm when I was in the 101st. I didn't do nothing but eat MREs for seven months. I didn't do nothing in Desert Storm. I had a sniper rifle. Everything that drove by was in a tank. You know, I, there was nothing I could do. So um, I had a CIB, I had my Green Beret, I had basically done nothing in my career, and I got my, I have a bunch of Mac B. Saw guys there, and they, they just told me such great stories about how much of an asshole this guy was, and... Uh, <laughs> Welcome dude, to the club, huh? Yeah, it's... I, <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's awesome, brother, that you would take the time to come visit me in my humble household here. We are, we're actually in my basement, guys. Um, and, uh, dude, so uh, I can't say enough, brother. Thank you for your service with, oh, without yeah. a doubt. I'm Likewise. Like, he ain't leaving, uh, is he? Huh? No. No, of course that not. Like He's not accent. allowed to ever leave. Look okay. yeah. the door, dude. <laughs> I do have some questions. You got three hots in. and a cot here. Apparently, they have been asking questions. I just haven't been able to see them because the chat's blowing by. Okay. But I've got my mods on that. Okay. And people in the donor box, if you guys are donor boxing and it doesn't have anything to do with John and asking questions, I thank you for your donations, but I'm going to skip over them just for the conservation of time. But thank you. I will address them. There's a couple in there we'll get to. But one of the questions was, uh, John, um, did you carry mags in your canteen pouches? And what would you do with your water if you were carrying mags in your canteen pouches? Well, when we were in layoffs, we only needed minimal water. Okay. So majority of times before a mission, we would <clears throat> do a get a land assessment. So usually just carry one canteen of water. And then maybe an extra one in the backpack. And then, uh, the, and then use the purif purification pills. The reason for carrying uh, your mags in the extra canteen pouches is because you could fit a lot of mags in a canteen pouch. And, and the preferred harness that we had then, Chad, was the old BAR belts. Yeah. Because they had the padded shoulders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the pouches, you could get 420 mags with one on top. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, the mags face down with the tape so you get them out quick for yeah. a firefight. It's and funny. So, Sorry, that's right. don't no, mean no. to catch you. It's funny because Rick Lamb, when we did the World War II stuff, that stuff, seeing the progression of that carrying over when yeah. he was talking uh, that's why they're through the uniforms. Yeah, 
Because we did a video series where Rick talked about all the uniform changes through the military, through World War II, World War One, back to, what was it, 1916 or 1919 or something like that. He literally laid yeah. out the uniforms, really? the gear, yeah. guns, everything. Who is this? Uh, Rick Lamb, uh, another another uh, Special Forces legend. He's actually in like the Ranger Hall of Fame. Uh the movie Black Hawk Down. He's a, oh, of course. He he got shot in the forehead. A little RPG uh, <laughs> grapnel came through the windshield. And uh, anyways, I'll tell you what. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you two together. Yeah. And I'm gonna just I'm gonna go sit over yeah. there, Chad, and oh you God. can run the live stream because yeah. you two are basically uh, cut from the same uh, same cloth, <laughs> yeah. just uh, a, a couple generations apart. He was. Rick Lamb was my command sergeant major when I was a, a sniper cell leader. And then when I was a master sergeant on, uh, of um, my SFA team, he was my, uh, he actually became my battalion command sergeant major. That's where I knew him. I didn't know that he was like the last American to ever kill North Koreans in, uh, up, on, really? uh, up on the DMZ in Korea. Like 1990, I think 1990 or 90, something like that. Yeah, he killed a bunch of North Koreans. Really? They, they, they came across the border. That, and then um, Black Hawk Down, and then him as a Green Beret. The boy's, the boy's a legend. And Man. you two would hit it off. Oh, you, yeah. you'd, hit, you'd hit it off great. Black Hawk sure. Down. Oh, my God. You would. You two would get along great. <laughs> All right, uh, but, but back, back to you. What, what other questions? I've got another got? one. There uh, must be some grunts, and they think about the important questions. <laughs> They want to know how did you guys combat trench foot? I think that's a great question. Which honestly, a lot of people are laughing. That's one of the major problems in uh, in a reconnaissance team is you got to keep the body being able to move. So how did you combat trench foot? We uh, stopped wearing socks and underwear. No shit, it's that simple. Yeah, because and again, layoffs. Uh, <clears throat> the jungle floor would be damp. It's not like the the uh, the American troops that were in South Vietnam going through rice paddies yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, sometimes we would um, encounter water, get the jungle boots damp, but you had the little holes so the water would yeah, drain out drain and eventually out. your body heat yep. would warm up. Uh, Lynn Black was the guy that told me about that. Um, I went over, I had a lot of jockey shorts and the maids were stealing them. I was down on my last pair of jockey shorts, and I was complaining to Lynn. And Lynn goes, "Stop wearing them, because the jungle, the uh, the jockey shorts will give you cross rot, yeah. and the socks will mess up your feet." Yep. So we stopped wearing. Them. It took a few weeks to get the feet toughened. Yeah. But that's all. I, I never wore socks again until now, because the winter weather out here. Yeah. I see. I've I've got I got pussy feet. I gotta I'm wear. With I gotta wear. I'm uh, with you. I gotta wear. <laughs> I caught frostbite on four toes in ranger school. Oh. And uh, yeah, medical recycle was supposed to be dropped. Uh, long story short, if it- You forgot to get dropped. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's another story, another day. Um, long story short, if the temperature drops below 50 degrees, I lose circulation in my toes. So I invest a lot of money in warm socks. Oh yeah. But, uh, um, did you pull the steel shank out of your boots or did you keep them? Oh, no, no. They had to stay because you never knew. The reason why they were there was for punching punch sticks. sticks. So yeah. you kept them. Oh, yeah. Uh, awesome. See, me me too. I, I, I never took them out of my boots. Who would take them out? I, I, there were cool guys that would say, oh, no, no, you always take you always take the steel shank out. It, it weighs too much. I, and I, I've actually, have you guys seen the steel shank in a pair of jungle boots? It's it's as thin as a sheet of paper. It doesn't weigh nothing. So I'm, I'm curious. You didn't take them out either. No, no. See, I wasn't that. I wasn't that messed up. I wasn't. I kept that <laughs> thing in there. Now I wore j green and black jungle boots in Desert Storm. We didn't have the pretty desert boots, and they were fine. Uh, in the, yeah, they're, they're good boots. Good oh yeah. Boots. I got a pair up in the attic that have never been worn. Saving them for a rainy day. <laughs> I got a gentleman know. over here, Kevin Burkett, Borquez. Uh, he we, earlier you were talking about POWs and IMA, uh, MIA soldiers. He said uh, Master Sergeant Glenn O'Lane and Sergeant First Class Robert D. Owen, RT Idaho, 
CCN MIA 23 May 1968 in Laos. I've been wearing their POW MIA bracelets since I was a teen in 1985. Whoa. Wow. No, dude, that's awesome. Well, thank you, sir. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, you know, uh, Spider Parks, Don Wolken, myself, and any of the Idaho guys that, that ran missions with Glenn, to this day, it's as heavy on our heart because there's still the two men uh, from our team that are missing in action along with the indig from the team. They never recovered them. Wow. And uh, thank you for, for honoring Dude, them This that is a way. small world. This is back in 1985. He's yeah. been wearing these bracelets. That, Kevin, that's awesome, man. I, you, I appreciate Kevin. you letting us know. Yeah, for absolutely. Sure. Thank you. Got one here from Chet Common Sense. Oh, no, this one. Chet, I'm not going to address that one. It has nothing to do with yeah. John. <laughs> uh, John, after reading the book and viewing other materials related to Mac Vsog, it seems to me that you guys were just put into situations to make contact with large numbers of MBA as your small teams were very effective at stacking bodies. How far off am I? <laughs> That's a, what was the what was the mission of sending in a small team to well, do uh, reconnaissance like that? Well, you know, we had um, the idea was because our government had you know the reason why there was a secret war. Our government had signed some kind of an accord mm -hmm. in early sixties that the communists signed from Laos, Cambodia, North Vietnam, our primary enemy, North Vietnamese communists. Yes. And they all agreed that no one would send combat troops to Laos or Cambodia. And those are the countries west of South Vietnam. Yeah. The Ho Chi Minh Trail would come down and there'd be branches into South Vietnam through which the supplies, manpower, they could launch attacks and then go back yeah. to Laos or Cambodia and lick their wounds and then come back and fight another day without any traditional American troops following. Mm -hmm. Our job, and the reason why there was a secret war, we had to go in and see what they're doing. So you had area recon, point reconnaissance, like uh, going in, blowing up NBA fuel lines, POW snatch, a wiretap, bomb damage assessment, uh, PO, going in for down pilots. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, some of our missions were designed to go to try to get to an American POW camp that the NVA had in Laos or just across the border in North Vietnam. <clears throat> there are only a few of those missions. I never had one. But we had intel reports. Yeah. So, like, we ran a target Echo 4, which was an area recon, but we also had intel report that there was a POW camp, and that's what we were thinking about, was to try to get to that, mm -hmm. get as close to it as we could, because... Um, but you didn't have to find we anything there. We didn't. We had recon teams that literally ran into air ducts that came up, you could smell food cooking, and they got run out. On another occasion, we had a team that was all North Vietnamese that had converted, come over to fight on our side. The team leader was uh, Sergeant Pat Eddington, who appeared to be Asian, okay, tall, and he was the one zero. His whole team dressed up, they knew what the codes were, they could speak a North Vietnamese dialect. Oh, they would walk yeah. right down the trail. Oh, yeah. Pat gets a mission. Go to these POW camp, where it's American POWs. The Intel Network, somebody figured it out. He's en route to the camp. He's on the ground, successful insert, moving to the camp, up on his FM radio, speaking perfect English. And NVA says, Sergeant Eddington, by name, we know who you are. We know where you are. We know what your mission is. Your mission is to come to his base. I'm giving you a choice. You can return and go back to your base or continue with your mission. If you do, I will kill every American here. Your choice. So Pat turned around and left. But and, they came up on our frequency. Yeah, and that, that's the, the part. Um, the, the more you learn about the stuff that these guys were doing in... Um, you start hearing about that stuff that the the bad guys, lack of a better term, had great intel and they had infiltrated different levels of command all the way back to the, on our all side. the way to the top. And then don't forget, yeah. um, in November of '67, when the Pueblo was captured, 
The North Koreans did that because Russia told them to do it. Mm -hmm. And the second they got into port, the Russians came in and took all the encryption gear off the ship. Yeah. At the same time, they had Johnny Walker, who was working in the Navy as a Russian spy, mm -hmm. who got all the codes. So for several years, the North Vietnamese knew everything the Air Force, Army, and Navy were all talking about with the top secret codes, because mm. they had it, Yeah, including some of our missions. That's why one mission, when we're descending into the target, uh, Sal, or fuck, I forget, one of the two guys on my team, yelled to the helicopter door gunner, because this is South Vietnamese. Yeah. And they told him to divert the, the, the King B, which is the South Vietnamese yeah. code name, to divert off the LZ. And the reason why, somehow, he saw a wire across the LZ. How they had had time to put a 500-pound bomb near Chad. <laughs> had we hit that wire, we would have been devastated and be fertilizer today. Oh, yeah. But Sal saw the wire, but that gives you an indication of how we were compromised. Mm. Guys, uh, we talked about this the other day, that uh, there's <laughs> nothing easier to shoot down than a helicopter. A 500-pound bomb would have shredded a helicopter. Even a paper airplane. You can shoot holes through a paper airplane. It's going to keep gliding. But a, a helicopter dr just drops like a freaking stone. It's funny how we were talking about today oh. while we were at Fort Campbell. Yeah. We were talking about how once you hit the spinny thingies, it's game over. <laughs> you always wanted to, be, you wanted to be a Taliban for one day or one hour just to shoot out a helicopter or something? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Internet's stuff. forever, John. Oh, that's right. Never mind. Only kidding. Only no, kidding. no, you're good people. Man. You're good people. <laughs> you're good. Yes. That we've got a great crowd here. You're allowed to say anything you, you want. You can say here. whatever. I will apologize you for it. No, we won't apologize for nothing. No, it <laughs> no. happened once. That's only an inquiry. So you apologized that. once, and it was probably to your wife. It wasn't anybody yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. That's true. That's <laughs> no true. witnesses. Yeah. <laughs> This gentleman right, so, here, Randy Clayton, said, right. since the number of men running recon out of MACB saw comprise such a small elite group, I've also often wondered if you've ever crossed paths with Franklin D. Miller in country, even though you both served in court. Um, no, I never had the privilege of meeting uh, Frank Franklin, and uh, but he did earn the Medal of Honor. And he's one of our Medal of Honor recipients from the Secret War. Uh, he ran out of Contum FOB2 and was one hell of a good recon man down there. There's a book called On Common Valor where it, it's written off of a lot of after action reports and Medal of Honor uh, statements, which includes Fred Zabotowski and Franklin, amongst others, in the book. And it's just a very well done book and awesome. focus on that. On Common Valor. On Common Valor. All right. You well, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, we'll come back after all you. All right, gents. Um, I have not read this one yet. Well, you'll uh, like it because the first chapter, a team is in our worst target, Oscar 8, all right. up in i okay. They're on the ground. <clears throat> all night, they're on a trail watch. And there's hundreds of troops going by, tanks, bulldozers, trucks with people, ordnance, which we document. After they've been on this trail watch for several hours, an NVA comes up to one of the goes, it's your turn for guard duty. <laughs> yeah. So this is one mounting yard to another mounting yard. <clears throat> when the other NVA left, the mounting yard went over told Pat Watkins, who was the Team 1-0, he yeah. said, uh, they just asked me to guard duty. <laughs> Can we DD Mal? Like, <laughs> can we get the fuck out of here now, please? You so, realize uh, how close you have oh, to yeah. be. To, uh, yeah. And but I mean, that's the advantage. I mean, that's of better. That's better than my boot you. story. I mean, the guy goes, yeah. "It's your turn for guard duty by an NVA." That's awesome. Oh my god! You mentioned the book. Everybody's like, "What's the book? What's the book?" Uh, you didn't mention the book. Cold. He did. He did. He did. It was a on long time the ago. ground, <laughs> the secret war in Vietnam. Uh, <clears> John Stryker Myers, John E. Peters. Uh, this is this is your second book. Correct, second book. And second John book. Peters and I were together at the FOB one, another recon dog. Right. And uh, he's a, now lives in Tennessee also. Is he really? Yeah, um, in Dresden, north of Memphis. But John ran recon. He's a better writer than I am. 
So he came in there, he polished some of the stories. He's got some unusual stories in there. Nice. They're not all combat. You know, I, <clears throat> those aren't the best stories. Well, like, you want I mean, everybody wants combat stories, but for uh, for guys that were actually in the military, a lot of times we like the other little so the the, the other little stories. Well, that... look, Chad, you're you're you you know how the medics are, right? Mm -hmm. In camp, you kind of stay away from them, but in the field, everybody wants a medic, and this is yeah. why. And one of the stories in there, we have a medic that came into our hooch, and he forgot that the uh, Swedish K fires from the open bolt. He comes into our hooch, picks up the Swedish K, <clears throat> fired off several rounds that went through the officer's quarters. <laughs> Fortunately, nobody got hurt. A month or so later, maybe not even that long, he came back into our hooch. Spider Parks had a car 15 with a new scope on it. And this is like state-of-the-art stuff. So oh, we're yeah, like, yeah. not that, I don't know if anybody's going to use a car 15 with a scope, but... We had it. It was really yeah. cool. Yeah. We had so many things to experiment mm -hmm. with. The medic, whose first name was John, but we won't get into the last names here, picked up the car 15, looked through the scope, fired off a burst of automatic. <laughs> this one went through the other through the other window, went through several de hooches, <laughs> and wounded one in ditch. The oh, sergeant oh. major comes in and goes, "You shot him. You fix him." <laughs> yes. <laughs> You'll be happy to know that uh, in regular army units, they've actually moved. When they went to the consolidated, uh, what do they call that? When they changed everything from being separate, can't remember what it was called. Uh, consolidated? They consolidated all the support. <laughs> no, no, they called it something. It was in the combat units. Instead of being separated by, you had your Combat support. teams, yeah. Yeah, they changed it to combat teams. We actually had in garrison our medics and all our support people were actually assigned to our company. So we worked with them in the rear so that we didn't just end up working with them only overseas. So you'd be happy to know that they kind of melded everybody. I have had them better. Yeah. No, they don't get any better. No. no, no, we had some good medics though. We had some. Good oh yeah. I mean, we got medic stories up the yin yang, mm -hmm. but the, the, particularly the SF medics. I mean, just they're the best in the world. Yeah. The training they get. And, uh, my God, I got to deliver five babies. Ain't that sexy? It is. I was I was the 18 Delta. I, that's how yeah, I started I my career. Uh, Through his powers of medic. manipulation, he yeah. delivered five babies. How many got pregnant because <laughs> of the medic? Got ten pregnant, but only delivered five. <laughs> oh, oh, the internet forever. Oh, Those no. stories are for Patreon only. <laughs> mm. Funny stuff. Funny stuff. All right. Um, well, no, we got another medic story. Got a medic, quick medic. Okay. Um. Have you been to Walmart lately? Is that a true Do you know question? the owner of Walmart, the founder? Um, Sam mm, Walton. Walton, Sam Walton, yeah. His son, yeah. John Thomas Walton, okay. was a Green Beret medic. You know, I, I, I had heard that before. I did. Chapter four of Across the Fence. Chapter four of this one, right? Here. <clears throat> John okay. was on a recon team, a spike team, Louisiana. Uh, three, man, three Americans, three in Didge. They get into a target in the Ashaw Valley. The team gets overrun, and uh, they break contact. John was sitting on a log, and there was a, one of his team members, an indigenous team member, mm -hmm. sitting next to him. And John looked over his shoulder and saw an NVA stand up with a Cheshire grin on his face. Mm -hmm. And he had his AK-47 and went full automatic across John and his team member. Four rounds hit the, hit the indig. No, John didn't get any impact wounds. So John comes up, kills a guy, blows him back into the jungle, begins patching him up. They get overrun again. The third time they get overrun, the team leader called in an airstrike on the team. Uh, A1 Sky Raider. Like not within 20 feet, like no, put it on, on my the position. Team. That's right out. That's right out of the movies. Everybody's like, "Well, that's Hollywood. That would never actually happen. Right. You would never do that in combat." So they did it. In they combat. did it. Yeah. And so uh, before they they got overrun, John had been sitting near the team leader, Pete Boggs, and Pete goes, "I want you to go back and keep an eye on that indigenous troop that got shot four times because mm -hmm. John had passed yeah. up all the wounds. Yeah. He was stable, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but and he was." taking care of that perimeter, yeah. even with four bullet holes and in it. Still pulling security. Yeah, so John yeah. goes back to him. Another team member sits where he is. 
And so there's a team member, the team leader, Pete Boggs, yep. the Indig, and then Tom Cunningham, who came into camp earlier that week. Brand it's new assigned, guy. Brand new. Brand new. Uh, gone through training group, um, volunteer for the team, gets on the team, gets on the ground. Uh, they call in the airstrike. The A1 Sky Raider made a 20 mic mic run across the team, which broke the NVA attack. That's the good news. The bad news, uh, the indige between uh, Pete and Tom Cunningham was killed by the 20 mic mic rounds. Um, two rounds hit Cunningham. One destroyed his radio, the PRC 25 on his back. Damn. The shrapnel wounded the team leader, and the other round took off Tom's leg. And the round hit him and Lily threw him in the air. And Tom Cunningham had this out of body experience where he's in the back watching his body fly through the air with the greatest of ease. And then when the body landed, Tom said to himself, Am I alive? He couldn't figure out his finally says, Oh, hey Tom! He yelled his name out to himself. He returned to his body. By that time, John Walton got to him, tied off, the, tied off the leg, passed up the other shrapnel on him. Um, they finally came in for, uh, a King Bee came in. Mm -hmm. So John took Tom Cunningham over, put him on, got the wound in Dig on, put Pete Boggs, the team leader on. Helicopter takes off, it's Captain Tin uh, from the uh, South Vietnamese Air Force. He takes off. Second helicopter comes in, gets shot out. The third helicopter comes in and gets shot out. Captain Tin hears this. He comes back, lands to pick up John. Still got all the, everybody else still, still on still his on bird. It. And it's, it's August 3rd, 1968. So we got heat issues. You got the elevation. Anyways, John gets to the helicopter uh, with the one team member, the indigenous troop who was not uh, wounded. They jump on a helicopter. And now, this is the uh, H-34 has the two struts on each side. Yeah, yeah. Ken starts running downhill and takes <laughs> off <laughs> under fire. But they don't have enough lift to get out. Just enough to get over the trees. He gets barely gets over the trees, goes down into a valley, and takes laps around the valley before returning back to base, all while under enemy fire. To get back to the base, John kept Tom alive. Tom went on to, to live a productive life as an attorney, had two children, and uh, very he was happily married for many years. He had a wonderful lady. And, uh, but when they got back to the medical hospital, it was an American hospital. We go in and get Tom Cunningham in, patch him, they take him in. Pete Boggs goes in. John puts the team member the indigenous troop yeah. on, the, on the, with four bullet holes in them. And the Americans go, we can't take him. John pulls car 15, are you gonna take him or are you gonna die right now? Yeah. They took him and they treated him. I'll that bet. sounds like some shit, Carl. But here, oh, yeah, without but here's how good our Green Beret medics are. The doctor was so shaken by our guys coming in. I mean, they're bloody, mm -hmm. they're sweaty, they're yeah. smelly, they've been in the jungle, and the doctor couldn't put in the IV. Walton had to do it, mm. and he kept them alive. So that's he, our Green Beret medics. He mentioned one example: uh, out of body experience. Uh, oh yeah, literally, actually watching his own body, and and, and people actually give us shit, uh, give me shit here on because uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell people all the time. <laughs> yeah, I go to church on Sundays, um, try to live a good Christian life, and everybody's like. What? What? No, you're. But Carl, you're. You're. Uh, you're. Uh, you're a, a gunfighter. You're. You're uh, a warrior. Yeah. Um. You can be Billy Badass. You can be all you want. Uh. All these superheroes that play their movie parts in Hollywood, but when you've been in the foxhole and you you see stuff, you do. Oh yeah. And I, I'm a big believer in divine intervention. Oh, they, without a doubt. Give me five. Yeah, without a doubt, brother. Oh I, I have, um, yeah, I, I've seen it too many times. My grandmom's striker and our family were praying. That's the only reason why I survived all yeah. that. I'm convinced. 
Yeah, I, I had other shit to do. Divine intervention. Talk about what goes through your mind when you end up on an LZ by yourself because you ended up on the ground and you weren't <laughs> supposed to. Speaking of divine Rewind intervention. Rewind first. Uh, what? You did what? Well, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I may have done some research or just listened to a lot of Jago podcasts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is at the beginning. Okay, well, this is... Well, the beginning the, the was... The peanut gallery has no idea what Chad's talking about. Okay. What happened was, um, it, we, we were, like, uh, as we talked earlier in our podcast today, mm -hmm. we had those days in the morning you'd go out and get shot out three times. You yeah. shot out. Well, somebody said, hey, let's find a hunk of jungle with no trails, no paths, drop a 2,000 pound daisy cutter yeah. on it. My kind of stuff right there. <laughs> and, and repel, I'll take one more coffee there, sir. And, uh, meow. <laughs> and so I said, let's, and we'll repel in. Yeah. Hey, we're all for us. Go, man. Let's we want it. to get on the ground. We'll do anything to get on the ground. We're tired of getting shot yeah. out. So, makes the, sense. The next day, that's right. First light, we're up. I forget what the aircraft was, but they dropped a 2,000 pounder. I'm on the King B. The King B's going in. Thank you, sir. I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll one, one for the road, one for the road. Before you get to your serious stuff in the yeah. big bottle. Oh, dude, that's eight shots of espresso right there. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, We're my doing God. an all-nighter with John's record fire. <laughs> <laughs> We're on a roll. Nobody's going to be upset about that. You know that. Uh, uh, well, so I'm, I'm literally, I'm standing, you know, with the King Bee. Some had two steps. So you go out of the helicopter, get on the first step, the second step. We're wired to repel in. Yeah. So we're descending. All of a sudden, ba -ba -ba -boom, ba -ba, there's secondary explosions. In the middle of the jungle, they dropped a 2,000 pound daisy cutter. Yeah. And we're getting secondary explosions. <laughs> the King B. Pollock goes, WTF, we're out of here. Yeah. So I jump back in the helicopter. We go back to base. And Cubby told us there was over three or four dozen secondary explosions. So in the middle of the jungle random selection yeah to this day ho chi Minh's going how the fuck did the saw guys find out about our cachet in the middle of the jungle we had it really well camouflaged well it's just your dumb luck okay so that's the that's the that's okay. the preference yeah next day let's try it again let's same thing why not and it goes in with two thousand pounder i'm the first guy down the rope halfway down the rope i hear joe bip the rag man going little, 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 little. Well, I'm instantly compromised as I'm repelling into the yep. LZ. And we couldn't land the helicopter because the daisy cutter didn't knock down all the trees. So I'm on the ground. I give them the sign that we're compromised, get on the radio, tell Covey. I see an NBA coming down, but apparently he had no weapon. So I, we're compromised. I fired a couple of rounds at him because he looked like they were going to fire. I forget yeah. all the circumstances. The, ki the helicopter takes off with the rope. Yeah. He's gone. And I'm going, okay, so this the Chad's point. I'm now on the ground by myself. <laughs> Hiding behind some tree logs. And I can hear they're talking back and forth to each other. So I, what I... Who <laughs> on the, the ground with you? Just me. Just you. Yeah, I'm just down there hanging out. out in the There's all the smoke from the bomb. 2,000 pound daisy cutter yeah. crater all by yourself. Yeah, and, it, and it was in the middle of the jungle. So they up some the trees. In the middle of a jungle, in yeah. a country you're not allowed to be in. Right, well, well that, we're not there, yeah. remember. Because we had no... Yeah, you're no, not really there. Yeah, we're not oh, there. Oh, yeah, you're we not, had, you, you have nothing on you that we marks you as an American. We deniability, yes, But sir. you are a cracker-ass-looking son of a gun. Ain't no denying. <laughs> you're either Russian or you're uh, American, depending on who finds the body. Indeed, you, who gets your first. There we go. So we're there, we're back and forth. Finally, the uh, the King Bee comes back, yep. throw the rope down, hook up, and um, they fired a couple more rounds at the helicopter. They're shooting at the helicopter now. And I hooked in because we had a Swiss seat, which is a rope Swiss seat. Yep, yep. And it supposed to, and we had a D ring up on our harness. Well, keeps you from laying sideways. Right. So I hooked up the first one, and the King Bee pilot started to lift off right away. He went up first, and then now I can see people. So I'm shooting at them. They're shooting at me in the helicopter. And then with the rounds being fired, Captain Tuong, who was the captain 
on the, on the helicopter, he then flies away, forgetting that You're I'm in the jungle. <laughs> so Tilt becomes the pinball on ricochet <laughs> off the trees. And this is one of those embarrassing moments. This really gets really embarrassing. So we finally get out of there. But during the time that I was ricocheting off the trees, the rope had cut my arms and really bad, like in the crook where you... Yeah, yeah. So one was bleeding, the other one was tore up pretty bad from ricocheting. I tried to hook into my D-ring. I can't. Because we're now we're going full mass, heading back to South Vietnam. Yeah. So I was rotating the arms back and forth, but just in pain. Mm -hmm. I'm not big on pain. At one point, <laughs> when I'm rotating, I get I hit an air pocket, and it flipped me upside down. So, so my Swiss seat went right down to my knees. I spread the legs. <laughs> we're up there at 5,000 feet. And I'm you're upside down. 5,000 feet. It gets, it gets worse or worse. <laughs> <laughs> because, and upside down. Yeah, because my backpack, my rucksack, yeah. and all my gear came goes, on my throat. Goes up, yeah. Right on my throat, I'm upside down. <laughs> and so I'm, uh, Henry King is up there. because He was with me on the other mission. <laughs> Henry, get my dumb ass down. <laughs> and uh, I'm flipping him the bird to get me down. And uh, ultimately, I'm on oh, close to being unconscious. The rope goes down to my feet. So my feet are spread like the cheapest New York City whore you can find. Try and, I'm, I'm try spread and not eagle. to have the Swiss seat slide off yeah. your boots. Because once right. they do, you're gone. Benito, Benito. Yeah. <laughs> it's a free fall without a parachute of any kind. And uh, I was starting to pass out. And, you know, you've heard about those, you get that life flashes before your eyes. Well, my life flashed before my eyes. I, I went back to some things from kindergarten, a few other things. And then I saw the local newspaper, and I was really pissed because the local newspaper had my death below the fold on the front page. <laughs> because in the early part of the war, anybody killed from Trenton, New Jersey, it was always an A1 story. Yeah. Like, and we, Harry Stout's son was killed. Yeah. I mean, Cliff Stout's son was killed. And these are people I knew. Yeah. Guys I went to high school with killed in action. I'm pissed. Not only am I below the fold, but they said I died in Vietnam. That's a fucking lie. I died in Laos. <laughs> and I don't want my mother to know that I died falling out of a fucking chute. Yeah. My rig. <laughs> so anyway, right when I passed out, and I just got done with this life blast before, I passed out. And I thought I felt elephant grass. And it was. Captain Tuong <clears throat> had been descending. Lowered. I passed out. And I woke up. King comes out, takes off my web gear, leaves my car 15, leaves my SOG knife, my M79, all in Laos where they are today ah, on some little mountaintop. They're, they're some he picked me up. Somewhere. Yeah, he picked yeah. me up somewhere. And I'll, uh, the happiest pain I ever had in my life. He threw me in the helicopter. My head ricocheted off that metal floor. <laughs> And it hurt, but it's like, oh, I, I, I'm still alive. Yeah, that is, pain yeah. I've ever had yeah, that's a great, life. great saying. I love that. <laughs> that was it right there. So, Chad, that's the answer, uh, long oh, answer to I'm a short honored, question. I'm honored to be able to hear that story again. <laughs> and and there's more stories like that in these books, guys. You got to check them out. Somebody in the chat, well, more than some one, a lot, are saying we should give away an autograph book. But this is what I'm going to do. I don't want John coming out of pocket on this. I am going to buy two books. I will get with John if he will honor a signature on the books, personalized to the winner. I will buy two books, and I will give them away on our next show. We'll do it. Absolutely. Okay. And then I'll send them to the winner. We'll connect on Thursday when I'm down at Fort, uh, yes. Fort Campbell. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Heading well. over to talk to some troops. Yeah. They wear those funny hats that keep neither the sun nor the rain out of your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> That is so awesome. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, All right. I do have some more stuff here. He's got questions. For let's him. do it. Uh, let's see. One of them was. Remember my remember my theory, Chad. With your skill and Carl's talent, we can go places. We can. Yes. We can. We, we can. can <laughs> Chris Lloyd said, hey, Carl, great to see you got tilt on TR. Take yeah. it easy. Chris. Here's the Chris. Keep up the good work with you out in New Mexico. <laughs> there you go. Joey John. Mayers. John, do you think we would be able to wear all the body armor we have now in the jungles of Vietnam? No. No, of course not. No, uh, and, and the reason why would be uh, just the weight. And in the jungle, 
unlike today's wars, that there's a, our people are out in the open so much, but the desert, the mountains, without trees yeah. in Afghanistan, uh, it's a different scenario. Uh, but uh, honest, a lot of it is they, uh, the commanders don't want to, uh, they won't let them not wear it. They literally, even when it's a situation where you're not allowed to, you, you wouldn't wear it. Right. The commanders are making them wear it. And uh, an example of that is if, like, we'd go do uh, recon missions. When I climbed a mountain in Afghanistan, I put my sniper team up on the ridge. If I had told the commander or that we weren't wearing body armor, I, I went in literally with my mountain rucksack, right. and, uh, my vest, and my SR-25. I had four guys on my team Three of us weigh our gear weighed 122 pounds. Whoa. One guy weighed 120. Now that's with the gun and all the batteries and water and everything. None of us wore body armor because our job reconnaissance. Our job was not to make contact. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, but if I had asked permission, no, they would have said, "You no, you have to wear it. You have to wear a helmet. You have to wear it. You have to." <laughs> and your gloves because it's, because and it's your a uniform. Gloves. Because it's uniform. We had, we had a scout so, in our battalion lose his job as a scout in recon. He lost his job because combat camera got a picture of him. Not wearing gloves. Not wearing gloves on a mission. And the SARP major fired him. What? Yeah. No, and that, that's the sad part. Um, and But that's the advantage you guys had. Um, and that a lot of special ops units have today is the latitude to... So long as you're not blatantly violating the principles of patrolling, right? You should have the latitude to think outside the box. See yeah. the who's initiative. in charge of the team yeah, exactly. on the ground? Exactly, exactly. My God. So, uh, but yeah, no. Uh, and here it is. This mm. is literally um, that was me going up the mountain in 2001. Right before I got out, there were um, there's just constantly cases and. You go all back through history. I'm pretty sure uh, since we've been having organized militaries, there's been people violating uniform regulations and there have been sergeant majors there uh, <laughs> bitching about the length of the grass and cigarette butts on the on the ground, oh. I'm sure. I, I hate sergeant majors. You guys know how much I hate sergeant majors. <laughs> Oh, we were, we were at Fort Campbell me. today. Yeah, yeah. And we were driving down by the air the airfield, and uh, we drive by this one little. I'm gonna guess it's like a motor pool, and a, and all the soldiers out front had filled the parking lot, but they were also parked on the grass. And as we drove by, I said, "Oh, look at all them people parked on grass." There is a sergeant major losing his effing mind right now, and Carl goes, "Yeah, but it isn't this one." <laughs> 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 oh, good stuff. Oh, good you got stuff. a tiger question. Yes. Any stories about tigers? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> who, who the hell has a story about tigers? I mean, what? You, you got a story about oh, tigers. Oh, look at this well, little puppy. Oops, sorry. Travis is here. Travis, hold Travis on a minute. Here. We got to do tigers before we do dogs. Yeah, come yeah. on in here. <laughs> all, right, all right, tiger story. Yeah, so um, twice... We knew that we had tigers around and we could hear them. And the tigers went around our, our, our RON and we knew they were tigers. Yeah. They knew we were there and we were all and they're looking for an easy meal. Maybe. Yeah. And of course, you know, there are stories of uh, both the Marine Corps, I think it was either the 101st or 173rd, where a tiger went in at night, nailed one, pulled them out, and ate them. Yeah. We had two KIAs, I think, for tigers. Now, for our guys, in our case, yeah. maybe we didn't smell as good as the, as the other people, but or whatever it was. But in the morning, we got up. The second time this happened to us, <clears throat> Sal showed us the footprint of a tiger. And they're monsters. It was yeah. big. They figured, like, you see a little pussy cat, you see a yeah. footprint. Yeah. It's going to be a big. No, no, no. This was like this. Yeah, us here in the States, we think uh, mountain lions, we think wolves, you know. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, a tiger paw, it, it's it's like putting it in the print of like a black bear, except this is a, this is a, um, a feline velociraptor. 
it literally hunts in the dark. So you know why they didn't roll you up is because you guys had good security. Maybe. You were scared to death and you had your guns up. Maybe they saw the Claymore. I, we had Claymores out for the <laughs> RON. They didn't want to eat a Claymore. <laughs> Smart. Uh, we've got a gentleman that just showed up. His name is Travis Hall. Catch this. Uh, yeah. Travis was one of my, when I was company sergeant major, my old SIF company, uh, I brought him in. He was working up at group headquarters, uh, group uh, med shed. He's at 18 Delta. I needed drivers and gunners for the strikers for my assaulters to go hit targets in Mosul. I don't remember what year it was, 2010, I think. Uh, all, they all blur together. Oh, yeah. So I bring Travis in. Uh, long story short, vehicle gets IED'd, and, um, and was, he gets compartment syndrome. He's got cool scars where they had to literally fillet his, his forearm open. He gets put into rehab, everything, and um, never did make it to be one of our assaulters, but he found he wanted to go work with the military working dogs. Our, our SF, matter of fact, that's a picture of Rolex right there. You, you love Rolex. This is oh, a wow. picture from that deployment. And uh, that's not Travis. That's Rolex's handler. <laughs> Rolex was a monster. But Rolex, when we were training b between ops, yeah, yeah. Uh, Travis would volunteer to be the guy in the bite suit. So I loved, really? I lo everybody loved Rolex because Rolex would destroy a dude on target. Eat him like a tiger. Literally. Yeah, yeah. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> But uh, so Travis decides he wants to go be a canine guy and he excelled at it. Actually retired as a canine guy. You got it Velcro. Just push it on. Right. You get it? Close enough. Perfect. Perfect, John. Um, he retires. Long story short, he gets his old military working dog back. His lifelong friend, that dog oh, passes yeah. from old <clears throat> age. He has devoted his whole life now. He's got his nonprofit, and uh, this is actually his logo right here. Oh wow! It's Second Chance Canine. This is actually a bottle opener, and uh, his company's called Second Chance Canine. It's actually on these brass knuckles too. Check those puppies out. Get out! That's not. A, those aren't brass knuckles. That's a paperweight. Oh, okay. Made yeah. out of brass. Indeed, yes. That fits yeah. over your knuckles. Just happens to fit. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, wow. um, Travis has a nonprofit, and he was on here last Tuesday, and I'm tr he had a, one of his dogs. What he does is he rescues dogs that are military working dogs uh, that all these civilians buy because it's cool to get a a Malwal or you know these, yeah, yeah. these shepherds and stuff. And uh, nobody knows how to handle these dogs, so they get them, they pay big money for them, and then they put them in the pound. To be put down because they can't handle the dog he rescues these dogs and instead of training them to be working dogs he trains them to be service dogs for special ops guys that have got post-traumatic stress and other mental issues um uh traumatic brain injury stuff uh, like tbi that. is nasty. yeah it is and uh God. travis is if I can do anything to help this boy, I told him I would gladly do it. So he had one of his dogs, he was here last Tuesday, got cataracts, literally can't see, like blind in one eye, 30% left in the other eye. We raised enough money last Tuesday to get that dog cataract surgery. That's how no. much we did it. Oh, but you got a little puppy here. So <laughs> Travis, come up, come up here. Here's what I'm going to do. All right. Um, no, 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 here, here. No, you're good. I'll carry that around and just right. lift it over John's head. Right. Here's what Ooh. I want you to do. Right. Is I want you to sit right here. Okay. And Oh, you're gonna get up? Tell I'm gonna get up. But uh Travis. Oh, okay, thank you, Mike. John. John, John, John nice to meet you. Nice to sir. <laughs> All right. My wire is Share stuck, so. what you're doing tonight at this is this is uh, I know you don't know who John is. John <laughs> is uh one of my personal heroes. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, anyways, I'm gonna give you, uh, I'm gonna give you the seat, and he's gonna do the giveaway of those. All right. right Carl, do you have there. another one of these? Yeah. What's up? Yes, I right there. Right <laughs> oh, there. awesome. That one's yours. All, All right. right. We um, knew you were coming. <laughs> sir, it's, a, it's an honor to meet you. Pleasure is mine Thank too. You, sir. We just had a transition of power. Well, let me just say this before we. Kuma, get to... stand here, Kuma. Come here, Kuma. 
Come on. My uh, Come my on, stepson, baby. who was WIA, uh, August the twentieth, oh five. Oh wow. His his uh, personal dog right now is struggling. Oh wow. And so uh, we, we might be coming back to talk to you more yeah, about please that do. later. Please Absolutely. Do. Uh, I, I'm getting a lot of trouble oh. if I don't show this little guy to uh, <laughs> yeah. to Susan. So <laughs> to Susan. Yeah, Hello, Susan. Susan. <laughs> He's a little badass. <laughs> so this is Kuma. And uh, we rescued Kuma from Georgia. He was in a, he was just kind of, he was, he was, uh, he was being abused a little bit, but not, ter not terribly. He was being, uh, he was being pretty neglected. He was like tied to a, tied to a tree on a little chain. And so we heard about him and we scooped in and rescued him. And uh, luckily we have enough awesome supporters that, uh, that help us to do that, you know? Mm. And so, uh, when, I, so I was a dog handler in special forces. Yeah, and uh, when I when my dog retired to me, I knew that that was something that was special. Sure. And so we started after he passed. We started a a nonprofit to uh, to get that for other guys, you know. And so we've been crushing it for a while, you know. Um, like Carl said, we raised <laughs> we we rescued this one dog a, a couple yeah. like a week ago. I actually like a couple nights before the. Are you gonna drink Carl's juice? Oh yeah. <laughs> Help yourself. Yeah. I'll hold it for you here. <laughs> Have There's probably something in yeah, there just, he doesn't want, though. Oh, um, no, this is just coffee. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so this we rescued Carl, him. Sorry, serious drink. I got him home, and uh, I saw his eyes were kind of foggy, so yeah. we took him to the vet, and he needed cataract surgery, and wow. and, and all the guys uh, stepped up and helped us pay for that, because it's about three thirty five hundred bucks for oh, cataract yeah. surgery. Um, Kuma's perfect, though. He's a baby, so... Um, <laughs> He he did have his his teeth pulled the other day because he just got an underbite. So oh, is that right? So poor Kuma doesn't have any bottom teeth right now. Um, he's such a good dog, Susan. Wow. I brought him just for you. I hope you. I hope Indeed, you're there, Susan. <laughs> uh, well, you know, people have asked me now that we've done the Jocko podcast. When I said, "Well, are there any green berets that deal with dogs?" I said, "You know what? I don't know the answer." Yeah, now yeah, I know the yeah, answer. Yeah. So I was one of first twelve. Really, the um, first twelve? Yeah, yeah. So what um, year was that? Uh, two thousand eight. We started dogs. Uh, really? Yeah. So I started dogs in two thousand eight, and I was first twelve, and uh, we t I went on four deployments with my dog. It's kind of like an additional duty. It's not Ooh. like an MOS. It's like you're an eighteen Bravo or Fox yeah. or, or Delta. And you come over and, and you do dogs. Even but, echoes are allowed to yeah, do Yeah, yeah, even echoes. <laughs> They're a little too analytical, though, for the dog. I'm stealing this. Yeah, help yourself. That's I love good. these. I love these things. These I, are really good. I, I went home and ordered the two dogs cases drink of these that night. Here, you want, you, you want him to... <laughs> <laughs> He's good. Are you sure? Come on. You want to taste it? Is there... Tell me, Kuma, is it bad in there or is it good? <laughs> Uh, I was told. I, care, I, don't care. I was told by my patrons to mess with you. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so we raised enough money to get to get uh to get his eye surgery. So we're wow, pretty excited. No kidding. Yeah, you want you want to taste that? Try it. Check it out. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's better. Well, he Josh, likes sugar. There's a reason that Travis is here tonight. Um, is that why? We had Travis on one of the last shows, and yeah. we actually auctioned off a class uh we auctioned off uh dude there's it was so like confusing <laughs> we auctioned off the brass knuckles it's a yeah. Yeah. chance canine and we also did this bottle opener which is pretty awesome out of a whiskey barrel yeah it is uh, i love it so jason knight <clears throat> uh donated all that stuff and he donated the class and he donated uh the online portion uh to his school and he just started throwing stuff out like hey Hey, we're gonna donate this, and we're gonna donate this, and we're gonna donate this. And Carl and I didn't have Chad to help us keep up, so we were like, "Wait, where are we? What are we doing? Where, where are we at?" You know. And so, I think tonight is the night that we're going to uh, get it straight. Yes. We're copacetic. Tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a gentleman named Shane who ended up winning um, <clears throat> everything. Really? Uh, he well, they they did a package and they auctioned it off, and he auctioned, he won the auction. Uh, from what I understand, he then proceeded to say, I don't want any of it, and I want to give it all away. Yep. One of the Whoa. stipulations on the class, I'm going to leave this for Travis to explain the stipulations on the class piece, but tonight he we are giving away this and this. Whoa. Yeah, so I'll he Come back the other way. Towards there you go. There you... Oh, yeah, I got it. Here, I'll yeah, do it. Yeah, there you go. You do it, John. <laughs> so yeah, Shane... We're giving away this and... These which are not. Other way, other way, Jimmy. 
There you go. Jim. Those are uh, paperweights. Paperweights. Paperweights, which are not brass knuckles. Not brass uh, knuckles. They are not, it's but they sure feel good. Just made it's a paperweight made out of brass. And you know, they go over your knuckles. They do. So, Travis, go ahead and give us the details on the class giveaway because that, I think, is probably the most significant yeah, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so, because I talked to Shane a bunch, um, I've been communicating with Shane, uh, texting, calls, emails, uh, calling uh, Jason and, and Jason's staff. Uh, I think what we've decided on, and this is kind of like what Shane uh, kind of hoped for in the beginning, just didn't get across uh, that well, was... The way we're going to give the class away at Jason Knight's Forge is we're going to ask you uh, to to nominate veterans uh, to to this class. So if you have a veteran in mind, if you have someone that you think is hurting, if you know someone that that is hurting, or if you're a veteran, um, please nominate yourself. Uh, we want to find a veteran that can truly benefit from going to this course and, and, and pounding on steel and, and doing all, you know, and, and the, the healing power that, that this place has. Um, what I'm, what I would like to do, Chad, if you could throw, uh, uh, an email into that, if you yep. would send an email to Joe, uh, J O E, uh, at second chance canine. Is this, uh, that's two M D. Nope. Nope. Spelled out. Okay. Second chance K9. Let's see. There you go. Second chance. K9. K9.com. All right. Email's going out. And then Joe is going to great. He's going to go through all of your submissions. And the three questions or two questions we're asking is how would you benefit from this as a veteran or, or the person, the veteran that you're nominating? And what would you like to see happen during this course? You know, you're going to make up, you're going to make a, uh, a, uh, a tomahawk with Jason, uh, Carl and I, if Carl can make it, Carl's going to show up, uh, schedule dependent. I will be there. Um, uh, and we will be there to hang out with you guys, uh, relive stories with you guys and stuff like that. Um, you do have to pay your own way to get to Kingsport, Tennessee, and you do have to pay for your own lodging for it's four. it's a four day class. So, so again, if you guys have someone that's hurting, um, please let us know nominate them, give us a short bio on why you think that they would benefit from this course. And uh, we will go through those bios and our, the board and Jason and everybody will kind of like go, this is the guy, you know, and, and it's not going to be like, it's not going to be a random thing. We really want to know, like pour your heart into this kind of thing. We really want to help someone. Um, well, and, here we go. I'll help you out. If you get somebody in these room and board for four days, then we'll find a way to make it happen from Saw Chronicles. Yeah, don't let that be the thing that yeah, don't let, keeps them. Okay, awesome. So if you can't if you can't afford it, but you still want to go, uh, these gentlemen are going to make that happen for we'll you. We'll make it happen. That's awesome. So, I appreciate it. Part of our SF family here. Yeah, yeah so so uh, so let us know. Um, send us, let me, let me double check that email so I don't get it wrong. Let me text the household six um, and, and be... <laughs> Home sink. Home sink. Okay, so while Travis is doing that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start the giveaway. John, which one do you want to give away first? Do you want to give the barrel piece bottle opener? Or do you want to give Well, away? I'm getting kind of tired, so we, we better get rid of the heavy one first. <laughs> okay. This, these are not brass knuckles. They are a paperweight. It's a paperweight. And it is really cool, complete with the, cane, with the logo down here at the bottom. Second chance canine. Second chance canine. Second chance canine. So Jason's an awesome dude, and he donated three of these. So there's only three three, three of these in the world. Um, wow. One we I sent off to Nicole, who's our social media awesomeness. She does giveaways. <laughs> she finds our our uh, our super awesome people that like support us and stuff like that. Um, yep, it's just Joe at secondchancecanine.com. I was right. <laughs> I, I had to check. Oh, that's good. Um, Better safe than sorry. Right? You Always. know the routine, guys. TR that chat, and we're going to give this away here in a few minutes. We got it. TR. So that's the first one. This so is the you, heavy you duty. You kept the second one. So actually. Actually, we can do both. Well, well, I mean, I dude, can just draw two get, winners. Yeah, do that too. We can just do two winners. We'll I'll do just two draw winners. two. First winner will be for the brass knuckles. Travis, I we mean, do appreciate you, uh, uh, your third one, uh, thinking of. 
tactical rifleman and bringing it here. Oh, dude, our, our, yeah, yeah. We've dude. got great people here. We really so do. there's three, and I'm actually like someone's actually asking to buy my per the the set that Jason gave me. So I <laughs> it, I, I I can't not you know what I mean because yeah. it goes yeah, back to the rescue. Goes back to the dog. Yeah. So I was gonna keep a set. But uh, someone's trying the to buy it. Right. Yeah, yeah. They, they better bid high. Someone hey, you that. are so cut <laughs> off. You are so cut off, yeah, Josh. Josh. No more. <laughs> if you're still listening, Josh, that means get off your ass and drop the PayPal. Right. Or ass knuckles. Yeah. That's what that means. Chad, can you put uh, Joe's email in there just one more time? Oh, yeah. so, Susan, uh, can you go ahead and... There we go. <laughs> Joe. So the uh, hard alcohol black rifle coffee is it's, <laughs> it's got me wired here. Yeah. <laughs> I could drive to New York City tonight. Um, that's a long drive, brother. I've done that. No, he yeah. could do it. He could do it. You guys are awesome. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, so this is going to be given away tonight. We're going to put a two week uh, on the the dominations. Okay. So two weeks from today. The nominations close, right? So push this out. Talk to your friends. Tell them about it. Um, we want to read your. We want to read. We want to. And then we're going to take two weeks to go through the submissions and pick the right people or the right person. Cool. Um, and uh, come here, handsome boy. What are you doing? I know you guys are here for the dogs. So let me get him up here. Indeed. He's better looking than we are. Oh, yeah, he is. That is a good looking dog. What's, it, uh, what's the IV site for? Uh, he had his bottom teeth pulled because he had an underbite. Okay. Um, and so we were trying to, we're trying to fix it early, and then uh, get. So we pulled all his bottom canines out. Okay. So that it could correct itself. Um, we like we could have just left it, but we're we really try to be above. You know, like we try to give these dogs the standard of care that no other place is giving. Yeah. You know, and so it was expensive, <laughs> and he had to go. Un he had to go under anesthesia to get it done. But if it gives him a normal mouth, you know, yeah, later on in course, life, we're yeah. willing to do it. So we all want a normal mouth. <laughs> do you know, you know, Susan named this dog, right? That's what you said. Yeah, dude. yeah. That's Susan, awesome. Susan That's named awesome. this guy. So, so yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty stoked. Uh, he's, he's been an awesome addition to the, to the pack. So, man, John, we're glad to, to have you here. To have a canine without canines. <laughs> I still got canines. Just he's got tops. tops right? Yeah, he's tops. got tops. Yeah, it's only half. So it's half more a like a, a Dracula now. <laughs> let me see if you. Let me see if you'll show. Uh, he's not going to show. Hey, my buddy Landon texted me just now. Yeah. He said, "Hey, before John said that he'd handle the the hotels, he said I was about to offer to pay for the hotel. Uh, I, I, it's up to you, John. Do you want me to tell Landon that uh, uh, you? We'll, that we'll, he's we'll got split it. it. We'll do half you and half. It? You'll split yeah. it. Yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Landon. Yeah, we we've got great people here in oh, yeah. our little Dude, uh, tactical rifle I, world. I try to limit how much I come on because yeah. I feel like everybody starts pouring money out at the rescue when I come on, and I'm like, guys, I just want to hang out with you. I don't yeah. need anything from you. You know, <laughs> like you're just really fun to hang out with and make fun of Carl and Chad. So you know, like he, he came here last Tuesday and gave me a Valentine's Day like pink bag. I got like, my bag. A yeah. pink bag? Pink bag with pink crepe paper <laughs> yep, and red yep. crepe. Uh, uh, with, a, with a sexy uh, Valentine's Day card, be my Valentine. Yep. Literally everything. Like, thanks, dude. Way to go. And Susan said thanks for bringing Kuma. Cool. Yeah, uh, Susan, he's going to be big when you come to the uh, Patreon event, Susan. I'm just letting you know. He's growing fast. He was little when I got him. Oh, 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 oh. he's like... Uh, I think we let John do the art roll here. All right, you gonna let John pick? I think we let. J oh, what am I picking? Oh, I think we're gonna let John pick the winner on this here. I'm gonna take it to the screen. Yeah. Let's see. This is my new jam, by the way. This, these things are my these new. These things are all. Awesome, yeah. Dude. Great. All right, John. That mouse is controlling that there. If you look right there, there's a bar that says "Roll it." Click it once. Down on the bottom? Down right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Pick it once. Once. Boom. Rocket Man 1975 is the winner of the Brass Knuckles. Nice. Whoa. Dude. Go so ahead and whack that again. Whack it. Whack it. Roll it. Cylon. Unknown. Won right. the bottle opener. Dude, you guys are awesome, man. All right. Mods, please take screenshots of those and send them to me in the chat. Uh, for the winners, this is what I need from you guys. 
I need you to send an email to tacticalriflemanwinner at gmail.com and we will get you taken care of and get it out to you as soon as we can. Uh, I need a picture of your main panel on YouTube and then I also need you to make sure you have your address in there. Um, so we'll yeah. Get mailed out. We'll get them mailed out. Congrats Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, you guys are awesome. Thank you guys so and much. And you've got a nice run of, of chat too. Top chats rolling here. Uh-huh. People, the are to, people are trying to win it. Oh, is that right? They're going for the gold they or going for the brass. They don't They don't realize they done already lost. What do I do, Chad? Uh, well, there's a little bit of a delay. He knows. He knows. I, I said it. <laughs> yeah. okay. so, the rocket man. Right? There's actually one other thing that uh, Jason donated, which is his, his online course. Um, he has a an online series that uh, you know you can watch online and learn how to forge basically remotely. Um, and we're gonna give that away next week. Um, so if you follow our uh, social media, our, our Instagram, Second Chance Canine, um, we're gonna give that away next week. Um, cool. So, awesome yeah, man. Jason poured out the love when he was here. So we're just trying to like keep it, spread it out, keep it, keep it, you know, keep it going and, and be, what are you chewing on? Tearing up all my stuff. Right? <laughs> what are you getting? Oh. He's a puppy. Hi, Travis. Yeah. It's tacticalriflemanwinner at gmail.com. No spaces, all spelled out. I don't know. It feels, oh. it feels, pretty, it's it's pretty, it feels pretty good. Comfortable, it, 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 it feels pretty good. Got maybe a coffee beans over here. Maybe that's something we can do in the future. Thank is you, We can do tactical <laughs> rifleman live streams with guest hosts. Without, without and we just sit here Carl. and laugh at yeah, them yeah, sitting yeah. at the desk. No help. Wait, wait. We just all right, where are we at? Tell me where we're at. You are going to. We left off. John was getting ready to share with us another. We just wrapped up the story about tigers. All right, John, let's do. Uh, we do another medic story. Do oh, yeah, yeah, medic story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, we got all these deltas here. The camera, well, I'm so. trying to get you on mic because no, there's only three. I don't need to be on mic. Um, okay. Real quick, what there was something I was going to say, real quick. Oh, hey, uh, I don't want to miss this question from Donor Box. Um, John, Erica Hodgstetler, one of the first super chats that we ever got on a live stream was actually from Erica Hotstetler. She sent me an email. She, in her first question ever to tackle Rifeman was, had she, Carl ever met John Stryker Meyer? So that we kind of, Oh, really? Like two years ago. Yep. This come full circle. So All she right. says, this is amazing. We have John Stryker Meyer on the live stream. Thank you, sir, for joining us all tonight. Your books are great reads and also full of amazing stories. It still breaks my heart to hear Doug, the Frenchman, Lay they turn no, passed away. What another great hero he was. Carl, we need to raise money to give John Stryker Martyr all expert trip with us to our patron event. Dude, we'd love to have you. Our yes. Patreon course this year is going to be in Texas. We get together. We do. Uh, we do. Uh, he's actually one of our medical. He's one Put of our on. medical instructors. Uh, we do shooting, uh, medical, we're going to be doing uh, platform shooting from helicopters, oh. uh, some survival stuff, tracking, and... Uh, well, Any M79 saw uh, that? You know, I can work on it. No we problem with that Florida. No promises. Florida. With, with John, or with us. I will try. Man. I will try to get you a <laughs> M79. All right, but yeah, uh, like, uh, like Erica said, uh, it would be an honor to have you uh, come hang out with us. It, it's going to be a four-day drink fest. Oh, no. And, uh, no, we get together at night, spirits around the bonfire. We share mm -hmm. war stories, and uh, we just have a good time. Uh, people come with their spouses. They bring their families, their kids, and it's a it's a great, great time, without a doubt. So, anyways, you're, consider yourself invited. I know Travis is coming. Yep, we'll I'll talk be more about the details later. Yeah. yeah. And, okay. Erica, thank you, because the Frenchman is the only Green Beret I know Who's ever shot in the back four times and lived to talk about it? Mm. Wow. The rounds, he was, they were on break, and the freshman went to stand up, and the NVA opened fire. Four rounds went through his PRC 25 radio, mm. went through his ruck, through his uniform, through his undershirt. Each round punctured his skin. And <laughs> ran out of energy. <laughs> wow. Oh, time that perfect. Wow. And yeah. So, but it put him right on his face. So he jumped up, ready for a firefight, yeah. and the NVA just assumed he was dead. <laughs> and he's the only green bread that got shot in the back four times, lived to talk about it. And wow. then he got distracted. That night, he took a shower. 
He took his jungle boot off and the four rounds went in his jungle boot and he threw him outside in the sand. Didn't, yeah. Didn't even save him. Welcome to the Secret War. That was his first mission. That's, wow. uh, see, you, just, you can't even make up shit like that. Now, if that was to happen in a movie... Oh yeah! Everybody be like, uh, uh, no, nah, nah, that shit yeah. didn't happen. That, even that even Holly Weird can't be yeah. something that bad. Let's yeah, nip really this in can't. the bud right now. You cannot nominate Chad for Travis's giveaway. <laughs> yeah, they're already starting their shit. Uh, <laughs> if you nominate Chad, he uh he, he has to clean the bathroom. Over there. I don't know. We'll make we'll make him do something. Uh, Chad will probably be there anyways. Chad. Guys, guys, don't nominate Chad. Chad will probably be there anyway. Yeah, anyways. don't nominate Chad. He will. I, honest, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of vets out there that are having a lot of problems. Um, the VA, sometimes they think they're taking care of people by getting them the pain pills so they're not in pain. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of them wind up becoming uh, addicted. Oh, no, thank you. They're good, yeah, they're good, though, aren't they? Oh, I love them, man. So, so actually, when I got hurt, I, I kind of lived through that. Yeah. You know, like I lived through the, you know, like they were gorking me with like 10, 8, 10 milligrams of morphine at a shot, you know, and so like that. You know that dragon you know like when you're laying there yeah. and that morphine and it, d let me tell you there is no i can see how people get addicted to heroin because oh. there is nothing in the world like it when that morphine hits you and it just and it's flowing through your body as it enters your vascularity you feel, right yeah yeah and you're just like yeah. whoa you know and so um it's i can see i can see why guys get addicted yeah. you know and, and there came a point where they were just dumping pain pills on me you know and, and it, it was painful you know like i lost nerves yeah. you know and so um i had to just one day i woke up and i was like that's it i'm done you know like i just about really? six, six months into it i was like i'm done you know like I, i'm just finished you know like i'm finished with this you know and i, I quit the pills cold turkey it sucked that, really i dumb. can't imagine and, at the uh, six months yeah yeah six months oh. of just you know oxys and whatever else they kept getting. really yeah 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 it was bad um oh. So yeah, guys, if you're having problems, just just stop, man. It's gonna suck. It's gonna suck bad. It will suck. You have to do it. You have to. I'm gonna get you hooked on those. You, you know why? Oh, you know why Carlin, I started. Let me give you your seat back. You sure? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna. Right. I just wanted to say thank you guys so much. I'm gonna. Um, I just I didn't want to be. I love you guys and 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 I and I appreciate you guys and I'm afraid that like I don't want to overstay and and make you guys sick it's of me. It's all good, man. It's so, all good. You know you're always welcome. Oh, oh yeah. Sir, it was an honor to meet you. My pleasure. I appreciate you Absolutely. so much. So much. Thank you for setting the way for us. <laughs> well, thank you for carrying the standard forward. No, no problem. Yeah, man. I'm gonna take Kuma home, and uh, oh, I wanted the dog to stay. Yeah, <laughs> you can go, but the dog has to stay. Too many dogs already. <laughs> I do. I do. Brother. Uh, Thanks, man. Brother, thanks for everything. I'll see you later. Yeah. Come on, Kuma. Thanks, All right, guys. So I'm gonna fix my mic here. Ah. And while you're doing that, yeah. It's too bad he left me. We have another medic story. Do you want one more? All right. Tell you what. Do me a medic story real quick. It's not going to be quick, though. No, it does not. We'll come to. back on the rebound then. But um, this one from the third book, Saw Chronicles. Okay. And it involved third one of the book. most. You're writing a third book? It's done already, Sal. Really? You just, I just haven't mailed it to you yet. Okay. Okay. That's good. There's just one book you gotta at a time. Yeah, let me finish this one first. Yeah. So we put extra pictures in there for you. Help out, Sarge. All right. <laughs> in uh, September 1970, um, a month earlier, or two months, Premier Sihanouk from Cambodia left the country. Okay. Under pressure. And he had been the premier throughout the secret war and the war in Vietnam, but Cambodia was a key player. He would allow the communists to do anything they wanted. We, the U S were held to strict standards of not having anybody there. Mm -hmm. And so for example, on Thanksgiving day, when we were using the five second fuses, when we yeah. left, I threw a Willie Pete down on him. He filed a formal protest with our government over that Willie Peter round, white phosphorus. And two days later after that mission, I was on an ambush, ready to blow it, get a POW. General Creighton Abrams, the commander, pulled us out of the field because of that. No joke. It violated the rules of engagement for us. 
Anyways, moving on. Yeah. So the um, so he signup made, was gone. He made, the Congress yeah. are heading south through Laos yeah. in mass. The CIA, outside of our area of operations, further west into Laos on the southern part, on the plateau down there, they had 5,000 men that were fighting the NVA that were moving south into Cambodia, and they were getting their ass kicked. They said, SOG, send in a diversionary unit to take the pressure off the CIA. Hence, Operation Tailwind. Okay, yeah. September 11th, 1970, <laughs> uh, Operation Tailwind launched. Um, it, they, because it was so further west, they used Marine Corps uh, CH-53 Deltas, the largest helicopter yeah. there was at the time. Yeah. And they loaded up 16 Green Berets, 120 indigenous troops to go get on the ground and to create a diversion to draw the communists away from the CIA battle to us, to the Green Berets and their indige. And the commander was Lieutenant, uh, I mean, Captain Gene McCarley. And they went in, and as they were flying into the LZ, they took casualties going in. And, and, uh, well, it's just going right through the side of the helicopter. Yeah. Thin aluminum sheeting, yeah. Yep. And so, uh, the last helicopter in con had the uh, medic, Mike Rose, and Gene McCarley. I think it was in the earlier helicopter, but Mike was stunned because. In our operations, if there's any gunfire, you're com you're you're compromised. Yeah. So you oh, can't wow. go in. Yeah. But on this mission, they had guys getting shot on the helicopter. They left them on the helicopter to go back to base. The rest of them got off the and when they're on the ground, they hit the ground running. Within two or three hours, they came to an enemy cache. And there was a great weapons find. They got intel reports. They had pictures of Ho Chi, they got a picture of Ho Chi Minh. And, they, and at the end of the mission, we have a picture of two of the SOG guys with that picture. Nice. They're there, and the, uh, the demo men are going through wiring it so to, to blow it up. Mm -hmm. And while they're at the headquarters in this, in this enemy territory, in a base camp, the phone rang. <laughs> a telephone rang. Deep in Laos. This is an enemy telephone. An enemy North Vietnamese Army telephone. It rings. The Green Beret picks it up. How may we help you? <laughs> <laughs> and so awesome. um, the, they wired it. They blew up this, all the stuff. They called the napalm runs, destroyed the enemy cache. Tons of food, weapons. They got some intel reports out. And for every day... And every night they move. But the first night when they were set up in the perimeter, an RPG came in, exploded. It went past the Americans on the ground. Gene McCarley, who was the team leader, Captain McCarley, and Mike uh, Rose, Gary Mike Rose, was the medic. And went past them, it hit something and exploded. So the shrapnel went backwards. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and to this day, Mike has issues with a couple of his fingers based off of shrapnel wounds he received that night, the first night in the mission. Several of the others were wounded. Two of the indigenous were seriously wounded, two or three. And to make the long story short, later that night, Gene's tactic was, we will move every night, every day to keep on the move. And they had air cover so that um, Spectre would be there at night to protect him, mm -hmm. come in, hit the enemy troops, the enemy hit him at night. The next day, the enemy hit him again. They continued to move. And um, by the third day, they had uh, a few more casualties. And the CH-53 CH Delta came in to pick up the casualties. Mm -hmm. It came into the LZ. Mike Rose had the most seriously wounded, who they've been carrying in ponchos. Yeah, They improvised had two or three poncho liners, and they carried their guys. Mm -hmm. And Mike was seriously wounded enough that he used his CAR-15 as a crutch. He's the only medic on that mission. The helicopter comes in, and Mike and the teammate get ready to put up the first casualty, and the helicopter got hit, heavily hit. 
damaged and they had to pull out. There's just too much gunfire. I left them on the ground. The team moved one more day through the night, again, engaging the enemy in constant combat. On the day four, September 14th, um, they were on the ground. They were getting ready to move. And Covey came out and said, first of all, there's weather coming, severe weather. We will not be able to protect you. So we're going to pull this out. Also, be advised, there's hundreds of NVA coming at you right now. And that cubby ran out of gas. He had to turn around and go back. The team's on the ground. Hundreds of NVA are marching towards them. And their, their forward air controller isn't is there gone. anymore. So nobody can give them close air support at all. Captain mm. McCauley was able to get a hold of, I forget his rank, I think he was a first lieutenant in the Air Force, Tom Stump who flew an A-1 Sky Raider. That's the that's one with the prop on the front yeah. of it, right? Yeah, this yeah. is... A, that name is really familiar to me. He's an amazing pilot. On this day, McCarley was able to get a hold of Tom. Somehow, with the bad weather, Tom found a hole in the clouds, came down and made several gun runs that literally saved the hatchet force from getting wiped out. Nice. They continue on. Cubby comes back. The first helicopter comes in, they extract troops. Second helicopter comes, it takes more gunfire. The third helicopter comes in and they load up the intel and all the intel reports are put on that helicopter. Mike brings in another wounded troop and McCarley, Gene McCarley was standing there on a radio directing another strike. And his radio man next to him in Diz was killed in action right there. They right take there. his body, threw it on the helicopter. Mm. They finally all get on, and they take off. Now, the NVA were coming up against them. They had also used tear gas to disrupt the NVA on the last helicopter. And the A-1 Sky Raiders dropped it close, danger close, killed the troops, had the CS in the air. Mm -hmm. But it, it is able to get them to get off. If they're taken off, they get hit. Yeah. By some kind of uh, weapons. And the uh, Marine door gunner gets shot in the neck. While they're taking off, the medic, Mike Rose, goes up to this guy, patches up his neck, he gets him on the ground, and this, and this young Marine is like freaking out. And Mike tells him, if you were going to die, you would have been dead by now. You're not going to die. I'm going to keep you alive. Settle down. A great medic. Yeah. He saved that Marine's life. The helicopter continues to take off, gets hit again. As it's going over the first mountain, the pilot tells Covey, I just lost one of my two engines. They go over <laughs> the second mountain, and after they barely get over it, the second engine goes out. Now, here's a CH-53 Delta. Which is a monster helicopter. Huge helicopter. Huge helicopter. Yeah, they could carry 25, 30 heavily armed men, yeah. all their gear, maybe throw in a Jeep for something for yeah. good luck. Now he's like, he never trained on auto rotation with a full helicopter. Yeah. Oh. So here's a Marine Corps pilot, <laughs> now in Laos, just flew over this mountain range, got barely got past the granite faces of rock. Now he's descending, he says, um, anybody see an LZ anywhere? <laughs> And nobody said a word, because usually there's this chit-chat back and forth. Covey would say, you know, I see a spot here. Nobody said a word. So this pilot just continues to auto-rotate down, and he sees a little spot that he thinks he can get to that looked like it would be a, a lake or a pond mm -hmm. with some sand in layoffs. Anyways, to make a long story short, he auto-rotates in. The impact was so severe that Gene McCarley's teeth were turned into gravel Ooh. as he was being ejected from the helicopter along with Mike Rose, the medic. They crash land. They set up the perimeter. They get all the intel out. Another helicopter comes in, picks them up, and they're able to lift off. Um, when they got out, they had all the intel reports. Mike passed up that Marine. The other other troops who were wounded, 
passed them up, gets back to base, and uh, they had a little celebration, had their beer, just glad to be alive. Yeah. They handed out 32 Purple Hearts to the 16 Green Berets on that mission. On, mm. on October 23rd, 2017, Mike Gary Rose received the Medal of Honor from President Trump. Nice. For that mission. I was just going so to that's say, our medic story. tell me this guy got the Medal of Honor. He had the DSC. In 2017. Indeed. A few years after the action. And, and I, I don't... I've had guys actually bitch because I would not write my guys up for Purple Hearts for um, perforated eardrums and stuff like that. I never... People would bitch because we wouldn't put each other in for um, bronze stars. I watched a, a seventh group guy get a silver star for man in the 50 cal on a Humvee. He never got off the vehicle. He manned a 50 cal on an armored vehicle. And I'm, the whole time I'm like, you wouldn't get that in fifth group. You just literally... You might get an Arcom with a V, but you sure the hell ain't getting a Bronze Star with a V. Uh, oh, let alone a Silver Star. Well, maybe the writer saw the movie with Audie Murphy. Well, yeah, but my thing is, um, we actually had a, a a female in the Navy that was with us in Kandahar during the initial invasion of Afghanistan, and she actually wrote a paper, and she's uh, she an officer, everything, academic. And her job was, she was there with a platoon of SEALs, and her job was to write their awards, basically, is why she was there. And her paper that she wrote was how Valor was going to have to be rewritten, basically, the definition of it, because modern battle with our UAVs and our satellite imagery and everything that, you know, there just wasn't going to be any hand-to-hand -hand fighting or anything anymore. So... The bar for which we give out Valorous Awards, she in her paper that she wrote, um, it's just we're going to change that bar. And I want to say it was a, two days later, literally two days later, we did another raid, initial invasion of Afghanistan. And um, Tony Pryor, one of the, one of the master sergeants in my uh, assault, uh, assault uh, company, um, we hit two targets at the same time. Long story short, Tony Pryor comes in a room, um, number one man. Number two man, instead of going with Tony, followed somebody that squirted out of the room. Tony thought he had a number two man in the room. He didn't. He was by himself. Shoots two guys. Two other guys jump on his back. Tony snapped one of the guy's necks and then pulled his pistol, shot the other one, dislocated his shoulder. Long story short... Tony literally killed two guys with his bare hands and uh, he ends up getting a silver star literally two days after this chick had this Navy officer had just said, yeah, Valor is needs to be watered down. So for us, <clears throat> you know, we, we advance uh, in rank and everything. That was the bar that we grew up. You guys set the bar on, just some of the insane shit that you idiots did back then. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> it's freaking crazy. Is that See, not crazy? Say that again for the ones in the back. No. I, <laughs> because that, no, that's the, what it boils down the to. The amazing yeah. part is everybody's like, we're just glad that, John, Young we're just dumb. glad that you're alive. Yeah. We're just glad that you're alive. But oh, yeah. You see, this is, did you got, did you decide to join the military because you wanted to, uh, you wanted to get a bronze star? That's not why you joined. No. No, it's not. And you joined because I, you wanted to make a difference. And that's what makes makes your generation uh, heroes, the, the World War II generation heroes. And it just bothers me so much when I see some of the stuff that people are bitching about in the military now mandatory sensitivity training and everything. We're not going to go down the, the rabbit hole of politics and everything. But, uh, John, I just... Mm. I, brother, you'll always be a hero to us, with, without a doubt. Uh, amen to that. Amen, brother. I'm just, I'm just glad to have you here, dude. 
I'm just glad to have you here, brother. Oh my God. We're part of the SF fraternity. You know, we yeah. were we had our time. We were preceded by the originals. Mm -hmm. Now I had the honor of working for a, a Green Beret original who today is 88 and a half years old. Really? Last year he beat the China virus twice. Damn. When he was only 87. He's still in shape. He's in better shape than most guys 30 years younger than yeah. him. He still runs a company as well as a nonprofit that helps veterans get affordable housing. That's why I was with him for, gosh, seven years. Yeah. And um, that's that's the generation we looked up to. Yeah. Of course, we the World War II, our OSS, OSS brothers, yeah. and the first special service force, and uh, all those. And then that was our generation. And mm. the generations that followed, my God. You know, well, you carry brother, on. Um, I'd love to have you back on the show. And uh, if you got we'll, coffee, we'll do I'll be back. You yeah, got, yeah, any, more but, to, brother, you got uh, any more black rifle coffee? <laughs> I'll, I'll be right back. Hey, uh, that, thank you, Erica, by the way. That's Erica Hotstetler. Really? She brought me that well, case. Thank you, Erica. And remember, she's the one that literally, one of our first comments ever was, have you ever met John Stryker Myers? And really? I, well, like, Erica, we thank you again. Yeah, without thanks for mentioning my hero, the Frenchman. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Carl. Uh, yes. Uh, Urban Cowboy 19 Delta said that talking about SART majors in Iraq, Sutter City, ours would stand by the gate, and as we would leave the wire on a combat patrol, he would make sure our boots were bloused. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That is one of those Ooh. awesome sergeant majors. Ooh. Now, guys, here, I'm here to tell you, um, oh. even when I was company sergeant major, uh, when Task Force Raptor rolled outside the wire, even if I, if I didn't go out with them, even if I stayed back in and I watched it all on Kill TV, when helicopters came back in, when the, the convoy of Humvees came back in, my ass was out there in the parking lot to greet the guys coming back in. Um, well, that means a lot. When we came back, there would be guys at the helicopter with a beer. You yeah, carried on they, the exactly. No, we weren't allowed that, that, to drink nothing be. but any yeah. beer in country. Ooh. Yeah, I, I, I actually know. have a really good story about a Super Bowl party. Ooh, Bowl. yeah. We're not going to. No, they, we're not going to. I don't want to steal your glory. No, no, no. Okay, okay, they're not stealing. We're sharing here. This is another day. I think we're getting ready to, I think Carl's getting ready to kind of slow it down a little bit. Probably really? end it yep. for the night, maybe. Possibly. Yep, possibly. But. Why? Well, only bear two and a half hours. I'm with John. Here's the next one. I've got I, this I've one. had okay, two okay. of these. I've had two. This, Evan, wait, John, Evan, Evan Happer at Black Rifle Call. We uh, thank you for these. I'm thanks, energized. Evan. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, can we get that by the pallet, yeah, Evan? We, we love yeah. Black Rifle Evan, Coffee. Evan, please. I'll, I'll send Evan in. And EDC Coffee, one of our sponsors <laughs> EDC tonight. EDC Coffee, oh, yes. Right, right. Uh, oh, Split yeah. Point is, uh, they got a good blend. No, they're thank good. you, I EDC. Love Black Rifle point, coffee. counterpoint on our coffee oh. here. You here like that shameless plug for a sponsor there? You like how I squeeze that in? <laughs> the funny thing is, is that we've got room for more than one coffee company. John, I, <laughs> I no, you you mentioned he, you you notice I got him hooked on these things. Like, yeah. Oh yeah, somebody told um, me to take those away, and somebody else goes, "Chad's smarter than that." Yeah, am I gonna take something out of John's mouth? No. <laughs> so I was in. Uh, I read, good. Um, and you mentioned it in your book that yeah. uh, you could smell America. He mentioned it oh, in yeah. this book right here uh, that you could smell. American tobacco and yes. just tell the difference from local tobacco. Absolutely. Um, and I noticed when I was in Korea as a private, I was up on the DMZ out in the ambush Ooh. one night. Oh, kimchi. And I little, could little little kimchi. Yeah. And when I checked it out on the map, because we had thermals, there was nobody out there. I was smelling kimchi that they were cooking at a North Korean guard post that was over a thousand meters away from me. Holy shit. And... Um, that stuck with me, smart cookie, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so fast forward. You were so bright, your daddy called you son. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> look at the big head on this knuckle nuts right here. We're having too much fun here. <laughs> so um, you two are peas in the pot. Everybody, let you guys everybody's like, Carl, why do you eat chocolate-covered espresso beans? These things taste terrible. No, they don't. Because they I, don't. I learned early in my career that, because I love coffee you need coffee to, you need caffeine to stay awake on guard duty my sniper ops like you had a, a four to eight man team right i had three maybe four guys so spreading guard duty up 
it's you're not getting very many hours sleep. You still no. have to maintain security. Guy looking through the spotting scope, watching the target. Um, guy pulling local security, and then one guy racked out doing priorities of work. You need coffee, but I knew if I was to make coffee on my stove, right, they'd be able to smell it for miles. So I thought, well, I still need my caffeine. So I started doing chocolate covered espresso beans. And I'll tell you what, those things got me up and down the mountains in Afghanistan. I wish we so had thought of many this. Times. Dude, it's See, a genius. I would have, that would have helped us a lot. But one thing though, um, what happens to this chocolate when you're in the jungle or you're in the desert? It melts, right? Ah, ah Not yeah. all the time. Uh, <laughs> these would melt, by the way, because I take these kayaking in the summertime and they do melt, uh, this particular brand. <laughs> but they, you can actually get them that are coated with wax and they don't melt. They get a little mushy. Really? A little mushy, But yeah. they don't become one big solid <laughs> chunk of chocolate like those do. Uh, because I've been in the desert uh, in Africa and had my chocolate covered espresso beans all melt, just a big <laughs> bag of snot. Uh, they're not that good when they're melted. Uh -oh. But no, dude, they're awesome. Uh, I will get you a bag of those for the ride home. They are, right. they are truly. Yeah, th those would have been good I'm in the good jungle to go right now. Oh yeah, those would have been good in the jungle. I'm here to tell you. I got a really good one for Parmelia right. Dion. He says, uh, have you been back to Vietnam since the war? And if so, what did you think of it? And if not, is it something that you would entertain doing? Would you go back and check it um, out? That's a great no. question. Yeah, it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, no, I haven't been back to Vietnam. A, I can't afford it. I'm just a poor writer. And uh, it doesn't fit our budget, you know, with five kids and everything. Uh, although they're all out of the house now. <laughs> but my wife does have a dog. And we love that little dog. But uh, no, and if yes, if I went back, um, all of my South Vietnamese team members, sadly, and a majority of the King Bee pilots, the Vietnamese King Bee pilots from our era have passed. Now, in the U.S., there are still King Bee pilots here. But for my recon team, HEP, my interpreter uh, on our team for over four years, yeah. ran missions. Uh, he passed away July 8th, 2017. So you, you actually kept in contact with these guys. He, he, <laughs> another story on, on April 30th, 1975, the day that Saigon fell, the day of infamy for the Vietnam War, yeah. um, Hep, his wife, was able to get to the airport in Saigon and was one of the last C 130s that left. And when Hep got to the airport, the C-130 was moving, and the back ramp was ha at half mast. Wow. Hep came up to the, and, it was, and the, hill, the C-130 began to move. Hep chased it, threw his child to somebody on the plane who caught it, yeah. pushed his wife over the tailgate where he fell down. He jumped up, ran and got alongside of the C-130, gaining more speed, that was never a big run, but on this day, <laughs> he ran his little ass off. And an arm reached out and grabbed him by the shirt and pulled him into the C-130. Gee, that is so badass, guys. You can't make yeah. that shit up. You just can't make that oh, up. Oh, yeah. You can't make that up, man. That's... So the History Channel did a production that has been renamed several times since. But that production came out in 2000. And I was interviewed in it. And... During that interview, hand me across the fence. Hand you the what? Book. Hand, hand the book. book. Okay. This photograph on across the fence, I showed on that broadcast. I said, "This yeah. is my team." Yeah. And um, which one's which one's him? Which one? Hep is the cool one with the sunglasses. The cool one. There he be. Right. That's, That's right. why they grabbed him because he. Was oh cool. yeah, he be cool. Now Hep had the sunglasses on day or night, even when he was coughing in the jungle, waking up the NBA, <laughs> he had his sunglasses on. <laughs> and it, he, of course, he spoke four or five languages, and Hep used to correct my English. <laughs> that's how smart he was. He, besides right, being a smart that's ass, cool, that's cool. but that's Hep, great guy, yeah. uh, one of my all-time heroes, and we we uh, we wept when he we, we lost him. But um, his nephew saw the production on the History Channel. He called the History Channel, they called me, I called him, 
It's the nephew of Hep who lived 13 miles from my house in Oceanside, California. No Damn. shit. I you called had him no up. No idea. He no was... idea. That his nephew was there. He gives me Hep's phone number, and I call up Hep, and we talk for the first time in 25 years. Wow. Thanks to the History Channel. And then during our conversation, it happened to mention that he was going to be coming to uh, Orange County, which is north of San Diego mm -hmm. County in California. He said, I'm coming out for a wedding. But he was busy. He, he was running a pet store at the time. I was working full time in a newspaper then. Couldn't get a real job, so I'm stuck in a newspaper. No, I mean, <laughs> and, and, and my wife Anna and I, we, we at that point, we had uh, four teenagers and a newborn in the house. So we're juggling these things. So anyways... Lost track a little bit, but I checked with, uh, I was trying to think, Hep, I wrote down and I talked to his nephew, I said, hey, when's Hep coming out for the, uh, he had a wedding he was coming out mm -hmm. for. So uh, his nephew told me, I said, give me the flight. So when Hep landed at the Orange County, the John Wayne Airport in Orange County, I was there. He nice. came off that plane, we got caught up. And it was sweet. Uh, we were there for a while. He was tired. I was tired. I had to get to work the next day. Yeah. He came in on a late flight. So I, I went up the next day for the, or for the wedding on Saturday. So after the wedding, we had the reception. Yeah. We got caught up. He came down to our house, and, and Anna cooked him a big dinner for him, his wife, and his nephew came by with his wife. Yeah. And I forget if he brought his kids or not. But he had two two little kids yeah. and just dear people, hard working oh, yeah. people, you know. And that was it. So Hep and I connected. We had reunions. Hep would come out occasionally. Not I wish he'd come out more often, but mm -hmm. he was but we yeah. talked. Yeah. And through him we learned about Sal and so many other guys that were still alive. That when each one passed away, Hep Okay. And we tried to get some of them to come back to yeah. the States, but we we just couldn't do it at the time. But anyways, mm. Hep, Nguyen Kong Hep. Nice. And then, uh, oh, that's awesome, man. That, oh, yeah. That is awesome. Just great people. You know, yeah. and these were guys, I'm alive today, thanks to the, we used to call them little people because yeah. the Americans are taller. Yeah, yeah. But it's a term of endearment between Green Berets and their indigenous yeah, troops. In our sure. case, we called them the little people. Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, like when I first, when Spider Parks first introduced me to the team, we go into the team room. And Sal, Nguyen Van Sal, was the Vietnamese team leader on the team. By 68, he'd been running recon for two and a half years. He was the one who could smell the NVA. Yeah. He's the one who kept us alive because anytime we got close to enemy contact, we initiated it thanks to Sal and Hep. Mm -hmm. That's how good they were. And Sal turned to Hep and looked, took one look at me. He goes, he's too tall. His feet are too big, and he looks stupid. <laughs> now, you know, Hep being the honorable vegan to me, he, he wouldn't tell me what the hell he said. <laughs> it took six months of me beating Hep up before he finally told me. And now, by that time, because when I'm on the team, I'm green as grass. Yeah. And Sal's the guy that's a pro. He's been yeah. running recon across the fence for two and a half years. I had to earn his respect. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, yeah. You know how that goes. Yep. That's John, the SF tradition. John, we've got a troublemaker in the group. Who? -hoo. Prepper 101. Uh-oh. He said, it's good to see Chad and John getting along and talking to one another. The BC and GIs have some bad blood. John is probably not tracking this. I'm not, but that's okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> They, I had this given to me at the Patreon event. And I guess they want to say me wear my rice hat. I'm not Asian, by the just way. Down, You're not? Down. No. Oh, you should pass, man. Yeah. Undunkle Dao? Yeah. Oh, man. Now, now look, look at the buku camera, dink. though, so your eyes are more slanted. There, there you go. go. You're buku dinky dow. <laughs> buku dinky dow. Buku dinky means you're crazy. You never, <laughs> you never fucking won. You mucho crazy. <laughs> there you go, Prepper. You got to see You got it. Oh, what a troublemaker. Funny. I'm not Asian, but we oh. have some funny people. You do. We're not picking on Asian people, by the way. No, no, we're not. No fools, no fun. No, definitely not. There's, <laughs> if there's one thing you learn about uh, Green Berets <laughs> is uh, if we're picking on you, it's because we love you. That's right. Um, if we don't like you, we don't acknowledge that you exist. We, there we, we go. just don't. And, 
Race, race color, creed have? doesn't matter. How many people do you have in your team? Uh, all together be 12. 12? How many Americans? Uh, in the beginning was three, then at the end it was two. Okay, so I think you know where he stands on Asians, right? I'm alive, thanks to the Asians. And not to okay. mention the South Vietnamese Air Force, the King yeah. Bee pilots yeah. were yeah. just so amazing yeah you even you started off the live stream with that praising them right out yeah. right oh, out of the gate had oh, that's to that's awesome had to that's awesome absolutely uh i've got what do we got a couple I'm, more i think i might have one more bring it on try one more nope uh, i don't see it nope that one that was it all right so uh here's what we got we have been going for john we've been going for almost three hours brother we just got started uh, i'll tell you I what, um <laughs> Hey man, I'm Gents, um, and lasses. John Stryker Myers, uh, his book "Across the Fence," a classic, available uh, on Amazon as audio books. Yep. Oh. And yeah. uh, the book I'm getting ready to start reading is called "On the Ground," and you have the third book, which is called "Sog Chronicles, Volume One." Sog Chronicles, Volume One. Now, and uh, hopefully what... next month we'll start Volume Two. Awesome. In uh, between doing some podcasts how about, with Jocko. Um, yeah, but what's the name of these podcasts going to be oh, that yeah. you do with Jocko? They, oh, well, let me say, this will be the exclusive for you, because this will be the first time that we're able to publicly uh, uh, report. Y'all listen up, listen up. First this time. Is important. First time. Want to hear us tell us, really important. There you go. But Jocko has been kind enough to start a new series. We're going to call them Sogcast. Okay. And instead of podcast, I, Sog instead cast. of pod, all right, we're gonna have Sog cast. I'll be the moderator. I'm going to interview Sog members. There are still several, many alive, fortunately, and we'll begin interviewing them. And uh, uh, Jocko has given us a sound, uh, all the equipment to do the recording. Yeah, and we're gonna do them in Tennessee, in White Bluff, Tennessee. And we'll do the recordings, and then I turn them over to his assistant, um, Echo Charles, who okay. is our able-bodied uh, master of the electronic world. Right. He'll edit them, and then Jocko Willink will post them on his social media. Nice. As of the last time I looked on just Jocko's, um, let's see, it would be the YouTube he has 1,040,000 plus subscribers. Oh, yeah. I mean, subscribers. he's so much larger than So we the are. SOG stories yeah. have gotten out to a broader audience. Yeah, and for sure. I'll be forever indebted to Jocko for that. He we're, not gonna, we're not going to ever grow that big, people. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, you never know. No, don't say yes, never. We will. Hey, with Chad here, you, get, you know what I mean? We could, <laughs> we could be growing a little I'm fertilizer ready. or some and more coffee are beans. 608. Thousand people. Well, you yeah. never thought we were going to get there, for yeah? Uh, I, because I told the film crew yeah, when we first started think this be channel ass. that we were. I wasn't going to do the jackassery. I wasn't going to blow up Tannerite and shoot aliens and have. We we just weren't going to do all the jackassery. So I said I wanted us to have a professional channel uh, about how to shoot, move, communicate, and we have since grown this and. Uh, John, it's been a pleasure having you. It got a little you, rowdy tonight, though. Yeah. We this, may, this did we, did we violate your protocol? No, no, no. no. Uh, actually, it was brother. a little more mellow than we usually yeah, are. We, You'll right? break out next time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you out of your shell next time. We'll get you out of your shell. Yeah, I you're, gotta stop being so bashful. He's gonna be a regular. I got a feeling. I mean, he's less than an hour away. A little over an hour. Can I, over an hour. Maybe can, hour? I borrow, can I borrow your Black Hawk just to avoid the 24 traffic? Actually, yeah, we no. know a little bird pilot. <laughs> oh, yes, we do know a little bird pilot. Uh, he sent us a picture from inside the cockpit today. Yeah. He was oh, is that to right? Come, he was supposed to come meet, meet us. He's like, I'm busy. And uh, uh -oh. the, the picture was the inside of, you could um you can recognize the bird because of the the glass bubble. It was not a it was not a MH60. It was a it was the A8. I was giving him frontline traces yeah. on our way home, seeing if he was going to try to hunt us down. Good stuff. All right, I want to give a big shout out to our sponsors again tonight. Uh, Sportsman's Guide, EDC Coffee. Again, use that promo code tactical. Big Daddy Unlimited, Global Ordnance, White Label Armory, and Safe Life Defense. Please, I ask you all, be loyal to our loyal sponsors because these guys sponsor us here 
every Tuesday. And um, Amen Airborne. Yeah, guys, I've got to be able to pay the bills because uh, you guys know the deal. YouTube uh, demonetizes three quarters of our videos and uh, I, I got to be able to pay the bills. So a uh, big thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to John again for coming. Pleasure to meet you finally. I heard a lot of things about you too, uh, brother. Yeah, none of it was true. Sure. Uh, none of it, it was an honor, true. John. Honor to meet you, sir. Absolutely. Before you bail, um, oh, before you coin me. Um, <laughs> the young SF guy tried to Those of you that don't know, an yeah. SF guy has to have a Now, you know all military units have coins. Challenge coins. Um, challenge called. coins. Um, mine is still beat up. Um, my it's got my SF uh, units logo on it. On the back is a quote by George W. Bush: "We will bring you to justice, or we will bring justice to you." This is my old <laughs> unit coin, and this is the Whoa. one out of my wallet. If I do not have this coin on me, and somebody laps it down in the bar. I don't have my coin. I have to buy a beer for everybody, everybody in the bar. If I have my coin and everybody else does, that gentleman has to buy for everybody. There's about 20 other rules that go with these. And I was taught all of them in 1993 when I first <laughs> earned my beret by some old Vietnam Green Beret wives, oh. the wives, the wives of the Green oh. Berets. And they made me promise that I would live by these rules. And uh, you only give away your coin. Um, understand, I'd rather give away that weight in gold bullion than I <laughs> give away my Special Forces coin. Brother, um, thank you for everything oh, wow. that you did. And uh, truly, uh, you, I consider you one of my heroes, brother, without a doubt. Well, Without let me let me reciprocate because we have here my SOG coin. All right. Ooh. That's personally designed as a SOG coin and on the front is Mac V SOG. And the back we have a small image of a King B with, with say, bullet holes in the tail section. Yeah. Nice. I'm gonna say Carl, if he had actually coined you as a non partial judge. That one would totally be would Trump mine? It would totally because that's got a Mac V SOG. Yeah, but that's like it. this is this is twenty four years after you had your coin made though. Yeah, yeah. So it's not fair comparison. Uh, but it's got Mac V SOG. But this is like whoa. But thank you, sir. Well, likewise. All right. Uh, I will. Is mine. I have quite the coin collection. That's pretty um, extensive. I was pretty impressed with that coin collection. Um, <laughs> they all have a story. I, I actually got a coin that has sixty minutes written on it. That's what? gay, right? Oliver North gave it to me in Baghdad while he was working for 60 Minutes. Literally, every one of my coins has a story. This one right here, uh, likewise, it's got a great story behind it. And the more time, stories to come. We'll more stories to come. The time we here at Tactical Rifleman on Tactical Tuesday had a in-person guest, John Stryker Myers from... Uh, uh, Mac V. Sog, legend, yeah. author, uh, and uh, just all survivor. great. We're, you and I American are both, survivor. we're all survivors here. Survivors. That's right. You've been through a lot too, brother. Well. You're airborne fraternity. Yeah. You're part of this, man. You're there. Sexy I coin, I will tell you guys. this, John. Uh, from, a, from a helper to tactical rifleman, this is probably the most iconic show we've done. I got to say no. that. No, no disrespect to one of our previous dude, guests. But no disrespect to any of our previous guests, but you are probably one of the. Wow. This this is the highlight of the Tactical Ruffman live stream. I'm, I'm sure Carl agrees. Oh, without with a me. doubt, without really, without you a doubt. are. Yeah, you having you on, dude. This is, you this is it. No, dude, you're one of my uh, you're one of my legends. Seriously. Wow. Um, I'm truly honored. Whenever whenever I see the Mac V Sog uh, logo, I, I see him, you know I see him every once in a while at like yeah. a gun show or middle of nowhere. Right. And. Uh, Guys, remember when you see that old, that old crusty eight hundred year old vet with his with his baseball hat on that's got the CIB and all the little patches all over it, and he's walking with a cane, and you're pissed off because he won't get out of your way. You remember at one time that son of a gun was more badass than you'll ever be in your whole freaking life, ever. 
ever. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I don't care how Leonidas your beard is or how many days you spend on arms skipping leg day yeah. and how many tattoos <laughs> you have. On his worst day, these old Nam oh. and World War II vets yeah. were so much more badass than I or you will ever even dream of being. And we say salt of the earth. Salt of the earth. Dude. I will tell you, have you ever met John Plaster? You do much oh, with him. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. He was actually, back when uh, I had the honor to go into sniper school, I got it on a reenlistment while I was in Iraq. Uh-huh. And, and to me, going to sniper school is a highlight of my military oh. career. And I had reached out to him. That's why uh, I wanted to go to it. It ran out of time. Yeah. He, uh, he was too busy not dying. Yeah. <laughs> but John Plaster, yeah. I, I had sent John. I ordered his book. He's got a really good book that talks about the history of snipers and that kind of stuff. And, oh, yeah. And I had ordered the book. And I, I had put in the notes like, hey, I'm getting ready to go to sniper school and stuff. And, and he actually signed my book and wished me luck and all this. And he sent me every single fucking book he had in his catalog. Really? So before I even went to sniper school, I was reading his Mac VSOG books and getting all motivated. And like Carl says, and I got another buddy, Chris, that says that, you know, if I'd stayed in the army, I probably would end up with Green Beret just because of that kind of influence oh, yeah. I had through, I would have ended up trying to be a Green Beret. Uh, I don't know uh, you would have made it. Through, but one no doubt in my mind. test today. But Indeed. only one will make it. No, three. Three? Three. three. It's actually up to like five percent now. Or something. Oh wow! Three, what are they being like soft? That. Well, they weren't met. They weren't met. <laughs> well, you know when I combo guys when we went through advanced infantry training. Yeah. So being a baby SF, yeah. We listed basic training AIT, go through the test and stuff. Yeah. And then there's this crusty old sergeant, and so anybody that. Had Who applied for like SF. Listening to John sergeant. say "crusty yeah. old sergeant" back in well, Vietnam, like, I'm thinking. Oh, now remember, I'm 21 then. Yeah, yeah. I know. So I'm, yeah. I'm at oh, AIT yeah. down oh, at yeah. Fort Gordon, Georgia. Yeah. See, and the way he worked it was all the guys that didn't make it, who had come in, did the test. He said he read off all the names. Said you guys are done. Have a nice day. The guys that were left said you guys go outside. I'm gonna call on each one. I'm the last one that he called in. And I, I, I go in, and he goes, okay, um, no, you're on the list here. He said, you know, you're really lucky. I said, what do you mean? He says, lucky that we lowered the standards. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> he said, you're in. Uh, on so, that note, on gonna, that note, we're going to save it for next time. Yeah. It has been awesome. Three hours tonight. You guys are awesome. And uh, you really lowered your standards tonight. No, <laughs> no, I believe that in the future we're going to be held to a higher standard and they're going to be, uh -oh. how come we can't have quality of guests like John Stregerman? Uh, it's all good. Uh -oh. It's all good. All right. Um, you guys know the deal. Uh, we'll see you on our next live stream. It'll probably be next Tuesday. Y'all take care and shoot straight. Like a bad dream, I'll be back. He's coming right there. Why are you here? I said go. I said go. 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 go.